Um, good morning and welcome to the seventh meeting of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for 2019. May I ask everyone in the public gallery to turn off any electrical devices that might interfere with proceedings. And the first item on the agenda is a decision by the committee to take items 9 and 10 in private. Are we agreed? Yes. Thank you. Um, I now turn to subordinate legislation before the committee, which is the Insolvency EU Exit Scotland Amendment Regulations 2019. And uh, I would welcome Jamie Hepburn, uh, the Minister for Business, Fair Work and Skills, and Alex Reed, David Farr and Victoria Morton, who are here with him. Um, I'd invite the Minister to make uh, a one-minute opening statement on the instrument uh, before inviting questions from members. Minister. I shall do my level best to make it within one minute, uh, convener, but uh, can I uh, uh, thank you for uh, having me here uh, today to uh, move uh, these draft regulations which uh, you're considering in light of contingency uh, in the event that uh, the UK were to leave the EU without a deal in which circumstances the UK would cease to have its insolvency regime automatically recognised under the provisions of the EU insolvency regulation. I won't uh, rehearse, given I only have a minute, the position of the Scottish Government in, uh, in terms of our great concern about a no-deal Brexit, but it is of course necessary to plan for all eventualities, including a, a no-deal outcome, and this instrument deals with uh, the situation that would be uh, created uh, by uh, that outcome. And given I have a minute, I'll leave it at that, convener. Thank you very much. I'll now move to the formal debate on the motion to approve the affirmative instrument, and I would uh, invite the Minister to formally move the motion. Moved. Um, now, I would ask members if they wish to speak in the debate on the motion. No one wishes to speak, so I will put the question to the committee. The question is that motion S5M15528 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Um, in that event, uh, I think I'll invite the committee to uh, agree that uh, I as convener and the, the clerk will produce a short factual report of the committee's decisions and arrange to have that published. Are we agreed? Yes. Excellent. I'll suspend the meeting to allow the minister and the officials to leave. Thank you very much. We'll now move to item four on the committee's agenda for this morning, and this is turning to our inquiry into con construction in Scotland's economy. And uh, we're joined today by witnesses Robin Crawford, Chair of the Review of Scottish Public Sector Procurement in Construction, Gillian Cameron, Program Manager, Supplier Development Program, Alan Wilson, National Executive Officer, SEC <laughs> Group Scotland, 
and Jeanette McIntyre, Managing Director of Indie Glass Limited. So, uh, good morning. Welcome to all of you. Um, just by way of introduction, there's no need to press any buttons. The microphone system will be operated by the sound desk. Um, there's no need to feel obliged to answer every single question, but we'll let the discussion develop as it were and you may come in on one and not the other question and so forth. And also I would ask committee members to keep their uh, questions short and perhaps in answering as well if you could try, try to cover the, the points you think are important but also be, be brief in doing so. So if I might um, start with an opening question, you'll probably be or at least some of you will be familiar with the 2018 Audit Scotland report. Mm -hmm. Uh, about procurement that says that the public sector does not always do procurement well and also comments that there are recent well-documented publicly funded projects with serious failings. Um, what would be your comments on that? Who would like to respond to that first? Um, Alan Wilson. Wilson. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Um, <coughs> I think there's a number of fundamental issues in relation to um, failures. Uh, the first thing is really the, the whole model of procurement, the drive towards uh, lowest cost tendering, the lack of expertise in a number of local authority and public sector bodies. All of these contribute towards poor construction. I think if you start the premise of building something that the cheapest is going to be the one that wins, I don't think necessarily you're always going to have the best outcome in any construction sector or any building whatsoever. And I think there's a number of different examples all across the country which uh, highlight that that is indeed the case. Um, what we see in our industry, and especially senior union contractors, is um, late engagement, passing of risk, uh, delays in payment. All of these cause issues in relation to the construction programme generally. So it's an endemic issue unfortunately cuts across almost every project that we see and our members are involved in. And you, you refer to projects being awarded on the basis of lowest cost and of course the procurement regulations don't require projects always to be awarded to the lowest bidder. Um, there are other factors that uh, a public body can take into account. Do you feel that uh, the difficulty is that they're looking too much to the, the price and not enough to the other factors that they're entitled to come to take into account? Yeah, I think there's definitely a pressure amongst public bodies to look for the, the lowest cost option and of course what happens there is that when the contract is awarded to, for example, a tier one contractor who often is a management contractor, not an actual construction company, uh, they then pass the risk and, and the cost savings. Uh, the term that's come into vogue in the last few years is valued engineering which really is cost cutting in another series of words. Mm -hmm. And all that happens is down the line of that chain, the costs are cut, the risk is passed until the person at the end has most to lose in, in relation to the contract going wrong. And if we go back up to the top where the actual work is procured, more often what we see now and certainly in local authorities is you have a procuring team sitting above the what we might term the industry professionals in terms of quantity surveyors determining what and how contracts are actually accepted. I think I saw Jeanette McIntyre nodding, nodding yes. your head there. Did you want to come I in on that? I would second much of what's just <coughs> been said. And I also feel that one of the key drivers um, in construction generally um, is to eliminate waste. This is a huge driver that many of the tier one contractors and every tier below that are challenged to, um, to improve. And many of the current uh, procurement models at the moment that we um, are driven by encourage waste um, th throughout the whole process uh, with multiple companies pricing um, and multiple companies trying to design um, uh, knowing in the knowledge that only one of these designs will actually be implemented um, and this comes right through the supply chain um, and I think we have agreed um, generally, and this is all the tier one contractors all the way down the process, that establishing a procurement model that focuses on the whole life 
of the building um, as opposed to just how much it costs to put the building up is what's required and that expertise I think is currently lacking in most um, of the public procurement processes that we see. Um, ensuring that appropriate uh, experienced chartered um, construction specialists are engaged in the procurement process I think is an essential step forward. So is there too much short-termism, effectively? There's a, yes, the short-termism is prevalent, mm -hmm. and what are perceived to be construction stage savings can be end up being extremely costly to the um, organisation who will inherit the building um, and every occupier of that building thereafter for its life. Mm -hmm. The contractor... Um, responsibility can end as little as 12 months beyond the construction of the building, the 12 months defects liability period. Um, and what's happening in th is the risk um, is being cascaded down the supply chain for design and structure and fire rating and compartmentation and all these um, uh, technical things that are essential to the building performing. Um, are being cascaded down the supply chain, uh, my company being one of the uh, latter trades. We are constantly now, very few public buildings, including schools and hospitals, don't um, involve some sort of design, uh, engineer, supply, install, maintain, service by companies like mine. Um, and I think that the perception of that is very, very poorly appreciated at the procurement stage. Mm -hmm. And Robin Crawford. <coughs> yes, um, I think what is slightly depressing is that these issues were all issues, every single one of them, which were raised in the construction of the review report, which we published in October 2013. And it's disappointing that six years on, um, so little <coughs> progress has been made in tackling a number of these issues. Um, to take the whole of life costing issue, that is an issue which has in fact been addressed by the Scottish Futures Trust in that a very good document has been prepared and is on the SFT website giving details as to how to carry out a whole of life cost. By that we mean not just looking at the initial cost of the building or other infrastructure project but looking at um, the costs throughout the operation of that piece of infrastructure. And of course, the initial cost is very often only a fraction of what the total cost will be in operating the building. The disappointment is that um, I don't think that that tool has been taken up to any great extent or to a sufficient extent by public uh, authorities. Looking at the issue of a uh, risk transfer, again, that was one of the uh, key recommendations in our report that that issue should be addressed. And um, looking at the issue of um, the race to the bottom and lowest cost tenders um, being the ones which inevitably um, tended to <coughs> be the most successful, um, clearly the public sector does have to look for value for money. That's a given. But quality is also important. And what we believe was essential was that um, there should be a wider scoring on quality such that the quality scoring was given greater prominence and it didn't just come down to the lowest price but sadly I think that remains the case that lowest price very often wins. Mm. Now before I bring <coughs> Julian Cameron in, you've mentioned the, the 2013 I think procurement review which um, Andy Whiteman was wanting to take up a few questions about that so I'll pass over to Andy Whiteman to um, develop that. Yes. Thank you very much, convener, and thanks for coming in um, today. Um, I'm just wondering why uh, it's why the um, the review that you chaired in 2013 hasn't had the impact you uh, anticipated. Um, I mean, I noticed, for example, that some of the recommendations you made, uh, you have one on what's called pain share, gain share. This is all interesting terminology. Um, the construction industry, you say, has a background of confrontational attitudes between client and contract, and you talk about pain share, gain share arrangements which have been put in place 
um, in the health sector, for example, but not elsewhere. But your recommendation on this is specific guidance should be developed, and you say this in a few places, guidance. Um, I mean, would that be one reason why we haven't made much progress, because guidance, which you've, you've, you've mentioned a document, um, is useful, but at the end of the day, uh, to implement any recommendations for changes in practice, you need laws or financial penalties or contractual obligations? Well, there are really three aspects to this. The first is getting the guidance in place. And the second is then in ensuring that uh, you have a correct level of skills in the procuring authorities. And the third is then in determining whether those persons responsible for construction procurement are following the guidance and do have the correct level of skills to carry out the construction project. To my mind, these are the three essentials here. Now, in terms of the guidance, um, a lot of the work that was done and following the review report, we had 66 recommendations in the re review report, 65 of which were accepted by government. One was neither accepted nor rejected. It was kind of put in, in limbo. Um, a great deal of work was done immediately following the report. A construction review development group was formed. I attended a number of the meetings as the report author. And uh, most of the large public authorities involved in spending attended that group, which met on a monthly basis and tried to drive progress. Lots of documentation. The first stage that was seen to be necessary was to say, what should you do? Because unless you tell people what you should do, you can't really expect them to do it. So a lot of effort has gone into that. And that process has, by and large, been quite successful. There are still a number of key gaps, but we now do have a construction procurement manual on the Scottish Government website. It's incomplete. There are further bits to be added to it. And a number of cons construction in procurement uh, notices have been published, which give guidance in a number of the key areas in which we made recommendations. So that a part is making good progress, but it's currently under-resourced. A lot of resourcing was put in at the beginning, but that resourcing has gradually been whittled back, and I don't think it is enough resource to take it to the critical next stage of completion and digitising the process so that you have a manual which is readily accessible and available to all public sector bodies um, involved in construction uh, procurement. So that's stage one. Stage two is the skills issue, and reference has already been made by others in the panel to great concerns about sufficient skill base within procuring authorities. And the third issue is then saying, well, actually, are people with the correct skills being deployed and are we following the guidance? Um, that has sadly not really got off the ground yet. And in my view, until you actually get a system of following up to ensure that um, the guidance is being followed and that proper procedures are being followed in construction procurement, it'll be very difficult to address a number of the issues which were referred to at the outset. I think Cameron, did you have comment yeah, um, to make on some of these issues? <laughs> yeah, I was really following up on what Robin was saying because I think there has been steps made to address the lack of knowledge that is in this sector, in the public sector. Um, with the publication of the procurement manual, but it's the implementation and how that's then been passed out to the various people that should be reading it, looking at it, and then acting on it. Um, our programme, I don't have as much construction experience as my colleagues here, our programme supports all Scottish SMEs and how to tender, but construction is a huge area, um, and a number of suppliers that come to us do feel that they don't get the early indication of projects that are coming up, and the public sector remains very risk averse to looking at innovation. So I think that stymies sometimes how that can be moved forward as well, as taking on board the innovation that might be out in the marketplace too. C can you point, uh, uh, Mr Crawford, to any uh, procurement projects that have taken place in the last few years that have effectively reflected the improvements that you were seeking in 2013? Or is it still the case, as you say, that with the guidance being incomplete um, and a skills problem, um, that we're still quite some way from achieving the ambitions that you set out? 
I don't want to paint the picture that all procurement, all construction procurement, infrastructure procurement in Scotland is, is procured uh, poorly, mm. because very many of the very large authorities um, are already um, embracing best practice, have skilled people in procurement, and therefore quite a large number of, of major infrastructure procurements are done competently and well. Mm. Um, and I think it can be seen that the number of um, problem cases which are referred to at the outset um, is, is not the larger portion of the infrastructure that has been procured in Scotland. Um, so a lot has been done well and indeed in our report we sought to draw upon a lot of the examples of good practice. The difficulty is in rolling it out across all the public sector bodies. Um, we estimated and that there was about four billion of spend on infrastructure in Scotland. It's a huge sum of money. Um, there is, in fact, no actual uh, guidance. Nobody is pulling that figure together, so we had to estimate that figure. We've set out in the report how we did that. Um, and the problem, therefore, is where you have an authority that is responsible for a major procurement but is not following the guidance or the, the best practice that we have recommended and um, perhaps is very under-resourced. Reference has been made to that already in terms of procurement capability, and then um, goes ahead on the basis of, well, we'll muddle through with what we've got, rather than saying, I'm sorry, we don't have the proper resources to carry out this procurement competently, so we need to buy in resources or share with some other public body that has these resources in order to um, make the thing work. And do you think that's a key um, observation going forward because some of the evidence we've had is for more coordinated, in some cases more centralised procurement model? Well, we certainly in our report recommended that authorities that lack the, a, the competence to do a big procurement, a big infrastructure procurement, should go to authorities that do have that um, a competence and that there should be more collaboration in this. That, that relies on people's self declaration that, hey, I haven't got the capacity. I mean, yep. that's, you know, going to be difficult in some cases. Well, that's clearly an issue. Any other observations? I think I could add that some of the best examples of procurement and whole life. Um, building analysis that I've seen recently have not been in the public sector. Um, they tend to be buildings like Maggie Centres um, for health care, which um, <coughs> very, very um, um, key drivers uh, in terms of what these buildings need are expected to deliver um, seem to come seamlessly straight through the procurement design engineer um, and construct and lots of post-value occupation surveys are done to see how the building performs for the end user thereafter. These are fantastic examples of good practice. I think the best examples that we've had go back a little bit of time, but the Commonwealth Games construction in Glasgow was one of the best examples that we were given in relation to engagement with, early engagement with contractors. And I think that's another key to this particular issue often those that actually construct the building are bought in at the very end, having gone through a, a process of, as, as Jeanette mentioned, uh, getting to the lowest cost and passing the risk on. So early engagement with the people that actually carry out the work and that often undertake the design, uh, who have surety as well of payment through uh, the introduction of project bank accounts, which I'd like to congratulate the government on in, in, in reducing the thresholds from four million down to two million. That will actually make a difference now, and I think that's a positive step forward. And that was part of the, the recommendations within Robin's uh, report. So I think that has to be mentioned as a positive. But that Commonwealth Games was a good example of where there was early engagement and things worked and buildings were built on time and within budget and properly constructed. Okay, I've got a few other things to follow up on. We're we're a bit tight for time, so I'll maybe come in later. All right, yes. thank you. Um, Jackie Bailey. Thank you, convener. Um, I want to explore with the panel um, the whole question of frameworks and hub codes um, as models of procurement. And, you know, when I look at um, some of the work that's been done on this, we look at hub codes dominated by maybe five 
big companies. Um, those five big companies operate at tier two and at tier three, so you know, the relationship could be deemed to be quite incestuous. Um, and four of the five are headquartered out with Scotland. Um, I also don't recognise many of the SMEs involved very much at the end of the food chain um, as being local. Um, some indeed come from the rest of the United Kingdom. So I'm kind of wondering, does the approach with the frameworks and the hub codes actually work against SMEs? Start with Gillian. Okay. Um, my experience with the hub codes is certainly Hub South West um, being one of the larger ones. Um, I do feel they are very proactive. Um, we're actually hosted by South Lanarkshire Council um, and so we work quite closely with both the council and the hub co. Um, they've set up initiatives and build Lanarkshire to try and encourage local businesses to get involved in the supply chain. So my experience from that and this biodevelopment program experience around that is they are being proactive to do that. I can't really comment on some of the other ones. I haven't seen that. Um, Maybe that I'm not close enough to see that. But certainly I think there always is a challenge where you have a large infrastructure project which a risk averse <coughs> public sector is going to always look for that larger contractor to be at the front face of it. Um, but there is steps in some areas being made to try and address that and bring the smaller contractors into the supply chain. Um, but I don't think I don't see that nationally across Scotland, personally. Okay. Alan Wilson? Yeah, I think to answer your question, I think it is an organisation which uh, micro and SME businesses find difficult to break into if they're not part of what's already established. Uh, the hub codes were uh, meant to become centres of excellence. Um, and there is some um, evidence that perhaps it's happening at the top level. But from our perspective, we find from our members that they, they see a barrier for entry in relation to, to bidding for work in these particular areas. I'm getting nods from everybody else. Um, the Hubco model is about to change, as I understand it. The government announced that they were looking at the model used in Wales. Um, does that address those concerns, or are we just going to see more of the same, but with a different name? I fear that Jeanette could Mac. be the case. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, endorsing what Gillian said there, uh, by far, Hub Southwest, um, having dealt with almost all of the hubs now, um, in my scope of work, um, Hub Southwest, the the cascade of key drivers there is very clear. Perhaps because of the uh, involvement at chair level by John McClelland um, and the others who drive that team, um, we're very engaged with them, and they uh, tend to um, hold, uh, maintain more responsibility through the. Um, procurement of buildings and attend um, meetings whilst the tier two and three and four contractors are being appointed. Um, there is definite evidence of more engagement um, with local employability, uh, supported employment. Um, they are uh, way above and beyond some of the other hubs in terms of that type of engagement. That said, they still um, minimise the tier one contractors to four or five, as you say. Not all of these are based in Scotland. Not all of these have key drivers being local employment. Um, and we can still evidence, even on these um, projects, uh, where I think the, the, the current um, contractors on Hub Southwest are Morgan Sindel, and Graham Construction, who are Irish-owned, um, mm -hmm. and um, Morrison Construction, we will still experience situations where the, um, the specification for the product will clearly identify the properties that the product has to um, achieve. And we'll engage with the main contractor, and they will say, well, Jeanette, we know you meet all the terms of the spec and our engagement, but we have a much cheaper price from a company based in Leeds or Birmingham, and that is the price that you will need to um, achieve to be engaged. So, so we lose out you on local economic benefit? Lose big time. You say big time. Can, can you kind of try and unpack that? Because I think 
it's a real missed opportunity when we're spending billions of pounds in construction not to kind of ensure that local companies get, get a slice of that action. You're quite right. All your fears are realised out there. Um, yes, we're, we are really sacrificing local employment, um, skills, training, development by not keeping control of procurement at that level. Um, for example, we just um, employed uh, North Lanarkshire's 100th supported placement. Um, we're fully engaged. I, at, at the moment, I have um, more than eight apprentices at various different levels. None of these um, statistics or accreditations, if you like, are key at the point of being compared with a man in a van and an account with Travis Perkins, who happens to be based in Blackpool, <laughs> if his price is cheapest at certain levels. Okay. But Hub South West, there's <coughs> definitely more evidence of an interest in that level than any other area. But that's one out of five. That's one out of five. Okay. Yes. That, that doesn't... Sad to see. Well, okay. Um, Alan Wilson raised a... Sorry. Yeah, ah, just I mean, again, you know, the Scottish Government have done great work putting in the sustainable procurement duty, which obviously is looking at local economic wealth building, etc. And I think at the high level, that's put into place into contracts, but the minute you kick down into the tier ones, it gets lost. And you're right, there's this drive to almost the bottom line. And that's where the smaller businesses that are maybe investing a lot to do good, to take on the apprentices, are losing out. Um, and again, you know, that's it's leaking into other parts of the UK as opposed okay. to staying in Scotland. So it's fine to have the duty, but the, the, yeah. the theory doesn't match the reality yeah, on the I ground. Think there's an opportunity here because the, you know, the UK government did put out a procurement policy mm. note that was all about putting into the contracts, into the supply chain, about maintaining that all the way down and looking at how you could keep the, the duty around that. Um, Scottish government didn't put out a an actual policy note about that, but they are trying to encourage that. But I think it's back to what Robin was saying. It's about that implementation, the guidance. It needs to go further to help okay. drive that. Um, and then that would result in people saying, well, you can't just award a contract in price going down the supply chain. You need to include these benefits within it. And I do think Hub South West have tried. The, the, I mean, they're getting the pressure from the local authorities there to do that. So they are trying to do it. And... Um, it's going some of the way, I think. It, yeah. Certainly the feedback I'm getting is there's been improvements in that. But it's not national. That's only one area. And, and the hubcos are controlled by the Scottish Futures Trust, which is national. Yes. So, so you know, there's the national body you would expect to drive all of this good practice. Yes. And they're not doing it themselves. Yes. So we're not even beginning to look at whether local authorities are doing it or health boards. Mm -hmm. um, the government, in effect, is not following its own guidance, which is most disturbing. I wonder, Convener, if I could finish with a very quick question. Um, I'm very conscious that hub co's now have a greater involvement of the private sector following the changes um, with ESA 10. Um, so they are now in a controlling um, position. I don't think that's necessarily helpful to some of the objectives you've outlined. But my concern is, do the hub co's actually lead to a further separation between local authorities and contractors, given that I think a lot of the expertise that Alan Wilson referred to earlier on has been stripped out of local authorities and I suspect now rests at, at hubs. Is this a good thing or not? Can I start with Alan Wilson? <laughs> Is it a good thing? I, I would say not. I think there has to be a, a fair spread of expertise across all procuring bodies. And I think if you overload one particular area at the expense of others, that can't be right. Okay. Robin Crawford hasn't said anything at this <laughs> point. So let me invite him to make well, a Well, the Hubcos, when we did our review, were really pretty much at their infancy. Yeah. We were concerned about the issue of S SMEs and access, and we spoke to all five Hubcos about this issue and received assurances that they would be included in the frameworks. But others in the panel have spoken to the current experience of, of, of the hub codes. In terms of frameworks generally, there is now guidance on the Scottish Government website <coughs> which um, sets out um, the importance of um, operating frameworks in a way which uh, gives proper um, access to SMEs to the frameworks, not, um, you know, splitting the um, contract into 
bite-sized chunks, which um, uh, SMEs are capable of bidding for, that sort of thing, and a lot more guidance besides. Um, but uh, I think, uh, nonetheless, you get back to this problem of is it being applied in practice? And, and if SFT, the government agency, is not applying that in practice, then one wonders what hope we have for the rest of us. But there you go, convener. Thank you very much. Colin Beatty. Thank you very much. I'd like to explore one or two of the comments actually that the panel has been making. And, uh, and I think perhaps this one refers to something that Robin Crawford actually said in connection with uh, the skills that are available <laughs> within local authorities. And I think the comment was made that the bigger local authorities appear to have a greater quality, quantity, whatever, of skills to tackle these developments, whereas, by implication, the smaller ones did not have the same level of expertise. Could you perhaps comment on that? It's one of the <coughs> pieces of evidence which we certainly um, were made privy to in the uh, conduct of the review was that um, there had been a winnowing out within local authorities of construction expertise within procurement teams. Procurement teams were quite often quite well resourced, <coughs> um, but not with those people who had the construction specialism. And it was the loss of a um, diminution of that expertise within local authorities which was giving rise to a lot of the issues of the construction procurement by local authorities. But you feel that the bigger local authorities have retained a larger measure of those skills? I think clearly the bigger authorities have more resourcing, but I, mm. I think even in some of the bigger authorities there has also been a reduction in terms of the skill base, which is why in our report we emphasised the need for any authority, um, and we're not just talking about local authorities here, um, because of course there are very many public bodies involved with infrastructure procurement, but any public body involved with construction procurement making sure that it does in fact have the correct skill base uh, before uh, taking part in that procurement. And if it doesn't have it, being um, uh, recognising that and se seeking other means of achieving that, uh, that skill base. In practical terms, what does that mean? In, well, in, term, in terms, terms of the impact on the, the project? Well, what it does mean is that you're not getting a proper brief at the start. You're not um, ensuring that the infrastructure is design-led, which we, we would have regarded following our review. These are essential components that um, you get a proper brief which really sets out what is it that the procuring authority is seeking to achieve. Now, that m might seem the statement of the blindingly obvious, but it's quite often the case that that has not been properly documented at the outset. So you need a proper brief. Then you need to look at the design and ensure that you've got the best design, uh, taking account of pre-market engagement very often, and many authorities have been very nervous about pre-market engagement because you've got to get it right in order not to invalidate the procurement. But, the, but nonetheless, we would regard it as an essential element of a proper procurement, having pre-market engagement so that you can understand what is available out there, then getting the design right. So there are a whole series of processes. I'll not go through the entire um, process, but it's getting all of these steps right before you actually place the procurement. And then, of course, in the procurement itself, giving proper cognizance to quality and whole-of-life costing. These are essential elements in a successful and an, in an ultimately successful um, build project. If we look at the other side of the coin, and look at the construction industry itself, um, do they have the skills within them for a procu to, to, to be part of that procurement process? In other words, I suppose what I'm getting at is, is it similar to local councils? There are bigger resources within bigger companies, therefore they tend to be favoured as opposed to smaller companies that perhaps struggle a little bit more on the resource level. Well, there's no doubt that a lot of the SMEs have found it uh, difficult to respond to uh, many of the procurement requirements of, of the public sector, but training has been put in place to try and address some of these issues. Um, Obviously, it varies. Um, the very large contractors, the tier ones, 
have very largely become project management organizations and uh, very many of the actual trade skills that we would recognize and regard as part of building um, you know, the, the, the electricians, the plumbers and so forth are, are driven down to tier two or tier three, the subcontractors. Is that a good thing? I think uh, there are a lot of difficulties in that, in that um, if the contract has been placed with the tier one, and it's a fairly small project, you're building in additional costs. Whereas Scottish Water, for example, have um, developed a system whereby they um, try to be more specific about giving the work to the body that will actually carry it out, in other words, addressing this issue. Given what you're saying, the whole system seems to favour the big boys, both on the private sector and with the local authorities, in terms of the quality outcome that might be anticipated. They, they, they seem to be becoming the market leaders. Is that the case? Well, the big boys are clearly more capable of um, meeting the procurement tendering requirements, and that has been a big issue for SMEs um, having the resources to um, compete in the public sector. It's very easy if you're a very large tier one to have all the resources available um, to carry out the uh, procurement exercise and to um, put in the bids and so <coughs> forth. That's much harder when you're a, an SME. I think that's been one of the big yeah. issues for yeah. SMEs. Yeah, and I think to add to that as well, your resources at uh, public bodies have, have substantially reduced as well. And I think if they've got the opportunity to maybe deal with one large firm as opposed to maybe 10 or 12 small firms, it, it's easier on their resources to manage that. Um, I, again, there, some areas are looking at step change that because they appreciate about how they wish to grow the local economy and get more small businesses <laughs> involved. But it's definitely an issue that the, the larger companies do have the resources to bid. The tender documents can be quite onerous. The risk that might be part of that as well. I think another big area is like the accreditation, health and safety. Um, some of the smaller businesses, when they wish to work with the tier one contractors, they'll use an accreditation scheme. Um, and different tier one contractors use different schemes. So if you're a small business, you may have to sign up to more than one, which could be just a couple of hundred quid, but you might be dealing with maybe two or three different schemes you have to sign up to if you want to work with that organisation. So again, I think that's a barrier for small businesses to get more involved. Um, our perception as well from some of the small businesses I've spoken to is they do prefer to get in the supply chain in some instances because they don't have that um, process of having to go through a tender and all the documentation and all the risk that goes with that. So it, it works in some instances, in other instances it doesn't work for them. Can I just add to that? I mean, uh, Gillian's mentioned the word easier and risk. I think what's fair to say is that um, there are lots of businesses in the electrical plumbing and other mechanical engineering sector who would be quite capable of engaging directly, you know, a point that Robin made about Scottish Water. And quite often all that happens is that that risk, as I said earlier, is simply passed down the, the path anyway. So whether they're involved at the start or, or you know, at the end of the process, the tier one contractor has, has, has been acknowledged nowadays a, a, a management contractor, not an actual contractor is there to manage the project and they pass that design, they pass the risk, they pass the issues of late and delayed payment, retention, withheld, etc., all the way down the line to the businesses who actually do the work. And I think if there was more engagement with these firms at an early stage, because part of the problem in construction is, and you know this building is perhaps a good example of it, you have a building uh, considered and then when people look at it you say, well we want to change this. Now, that's a natural progression in anyone's uh, life. We've done it in our own homes, I'm sure. You get a contractor and you say, well, actually, instead of putting this there, I want to put it over there. Now, everyone can do that, but there's a cost. And the cost in construction projects often results as a result of the change in design, the change of where things are placed. And that happens at a late level. Now, if there was early engagement with the specialist contractors to say, this is the project, this is where we want to engage with you, you give us your expertise, they would be able to avoid some of these issues. And that leads to the addition of cost 
and confusion and delays in payment because payment is often about disputes in relation to added cost. So that early engagement with the specialist contractors is vital to actually avoid some of these big issues. We, we talked about risk there and there, there's, always been, there's been an issue in previous panels and discussions about uh, transfer risk. Within the, within the private sector, within the construction industry there, there's a, there's a, a multiplicity of subcontractors and so forth involved. Is, it, is the question of risk actually properly addressed within that, or does it get confused within that system? Well, if I might comment on this, risk was an issue which came up a lot in the review that we carried out, and the concern, particularly of subcontractors, that risk was being passed down the chain. Um, first of all, that the public authority would try and pass the risk onto the sub onto the main contractor, and then the main contractor would try and pass it down the line. I think it's already been said that quite often then the risk ends up with the party least able to bear it. That's a comment we've made in our report. Um, that has all sorts of implications because it, it means that um, it gives rise to the risk of insolvency if these risks then do uh, materialise. And that then can, of course, not just have an impact on the subcontractor involved, but on the whole project, because you then find that the critical path may be thrown out by that subcontractor going into insolvency. Um, we believed and recommended in the report that there was a need for a very much better understanding of the allocation of risk at the outset of public sector contracts. It was not always appropriate <coughs> for the um, public sector to body to pass as much risk as possible onto the main contractor. Now, that might seem counterintuitive, but in fact, a sensible grown-up um, addressing of the issue of risk then allows um, it to be priced accordingly. If the contractor has to carry a huge amount of risk, he's going to price accordingly, whereas if the risk can be more reasonably apportioned, then the pricing can be more realistic. Part of that, of course, is in this issue of pain share, gain share, which has been referred to earlier. And some of these types of contract, many of which have been used down south for some time, and which are now, there are recommendations on the Scottish Government website as to how to use these pain share, gain share contracts. These sorts of contracts allow a more measured view of risk, but it remains, you're quite right, a significant problem. Jamie Halker Johnson at this point. Very, very, a couple of things, um, but I just wanted to go back. Um, obviously, I represent an area that ha has some very remote and rural um, communities, yet they still require um, public uh, projects to be delivered. Um, local schools and hospitals and the like, particularly uh, in, in Orkney and uh, the Northern Isles, where I'm from. So I was just going to, just to confirm. I mean, do you think? Um, those contracts are being delivered by large um, kind of national companies uh, rather than perhaps more regional operators. Do you think the current pr procurement procedures uh, and system um, is suitable or works for regional operators and for small businesses such as some of the construction companies that you find within, within regions like the Highlands and Islands? I, I can comment on that um, in that I am actually involved in supplying all the internal glass screens to the hospital in Orkney mm -hmm. at the moment, engaged through um, Robertson Construction, um, their main office in the central region, I think, mm -hmm. it is dealing with that. Um, and we were specified through the design process uh, by the uh, lead design team who were Kepi Design. Um, however, even that um, experience is compromised in that um, the original <coughs> intent from the health board for that building um, in that they wanted to achieve um, something quite special in terms of the, um, what the healing powers of light and fresh air could do, um, which is something that we um, probably goes back to Victorian <laughs> um, ages in terms of appreciating the importance of fresh air and daylight um, in the in healthcare and healing um, has been sacrificed 
at the construction stage due to perceived cost drivers um, and that many of the originally intended quite sophisticated and highly performing glass screens have come out of that building. So um, on my last, last site visit there, um, there are quite significant journeys through corridors um, within the hospital where you think, when am I going to see the light of day? Um, and I think these decisions have been made, uh, they're ill-advised, and they are purely construction stage savings that will cost the well-being of the staff in that building, not just the people who are trying to get well, um, because there, there was some driver at some point in that uh, journey through um, engagement with the Tier 1 and, and cascading down through the subs to, to value engineer that package. That but that would have been package. made by... That decision may not be made locally. It might have been made by the construction company rather than... It probably would have been made by the construction company. Okay which um, is, is an exemplar of the type of decisions that are being made uh, by the Tier 1 contractor that is not, in, in my opinion, um, in the interests of the, um, the health board or the end user or the patient at the end of the day. Um, there, there's um, hospitals that, and healthcare um, in buildings that are being built that are better exemplars um, in, in, in some ways, um, but we do go back to Florence Nightingale um, and the appreciation of the importance of daylight and fresh air. Mm -hmm. And we've gone all the way back to these values in the uh, the very recent building of the old hospital at Alder Hay, um, where these were key drivers that were appreciated by the client, appreciated by the health board, um, and driven all the way through the process and not sacrificed at any point in the delivery of the building. So you could suggest that, you're suggesting that this national procurement model might take away decision making from from that local from that Absolutely. local the local aspect to some extent. Yes. Okay. Um, just just also very quickly, one of the um, issues raised by uh, one of the respondees uh, was that uh, they argued that it was unfair that the procurement process does not do more to incentivise the direct employment of apprentices. And I was just wondering uh, where the um, national um, procurement kind of model could do better um, in terms of um, encouraging um, more apprenticeships or uh, more training and skills as part of that, and also where perhaps the barriers are. We know that small businesses have a an issue in accessing or can have an issue in accessing uh, apprentices so I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that uh, well we currently have an ap apprentice scheme um, and uh, we've been engaged with both CITB and Skills Development Scotland um, around about the, um, the fact that many of the existing formalised and recognised qualifications for apprenticeships are based on what are seen to be or deemed to be very traditional trades. So, for example, in, in my own company, I have no option but to bring my apprentice through a very traditional carpentry and joinery type um, apprenticeship. And on completing that, I then have to almost start again from scratch with a completely dis dif different discipline of training, um, which is all to do with working with aluminium and glass, um, because there is no apprenticeship in the industry that would give the apprentice a recognised qualification in that sector. Um, and yet we um, internally in buildings, this being a, a good exception, um, where glass is required to bring daylight through a building, it is less likely to be framed by timber, mm -hmm. um, particularly in healthcare because of um, infection control, than it is to be framed in either steel or, or aluminium. Okay. Um, but these trades, um, don't, the specialist areas, don't exist in a formalised SQA qualification. So we are engaging with um, CITB, Skills Development Scotland and um, and some other bodies to try to address that. The problem being um, there's the CITB are limited in the um, assistance they can give SMEs with training uh, because their 
remit is to cover work or skills that are actually happening on building sites. Mm -hmm. They cannot cover um, anything to do with uh, pre-manufacturing um, or uh, development of products coming from a supplier. Um, they can't cover a company like mine for anything that doesn't happen on a building site. So I have to self-fund a lot of the very specialist training that our apprentices require beyond, beyond the traditional um, uh, apprenticeship. Okay. I, I don't want to get too much on kind of innovative new ideas. I know my colleague's going to, probably going to cover that. But yeah, uh, Just to, to, to add a little bit further to that, um, there's a requirement in uh, procurement contracts to look at what's called community benefits. And it's taken in the industry that that often means apprenticeships. Um, and I think it's probably fair to say that uh, there's been a pretty poor uh, view taken by uh, procuring authorities about how community benefits should operate. You know, if you look at the um, record of the businesses in our sector, <coughs> predominantly apprentices are recruited by micro and small businesses. Um, in the electrical industry, we recruit approximately 1,000 apprentices each year. Um, not many of them are directly correlated to the community benefit aspect of that. That's a hefty investment for a, for a business, probably costing the region of about £15,000 per year to recruit and train an apprentice with little given back to the business after and certainly in the first year. So that's a direct cost to these businesses. But year after year, these micro and small businesses see the benefits of recruiting apprentices and, and take them on, training the workforce of the future. So these businesses who are at the furthest end of risk and delayed payment and late payment are taking yet another level of pain, in their, in their mind quite rightly so, because they are actually developing their business. But to develop, say, taking two apprentices instead of one is stymied because of the fact that the procuring processes stop getting to them, stop the, the you know delays in payment, the procuring processes themselves are not conducive to engaging and, and developing and building these small businesses. So a micro business of today, if I think in the electrical industry, uh, FES, one of our largest members, 250 plus electricians, started as a one person business in the 1960s. You know, that would be very difficult for a business these days to grow from one to 250 in a few years time because the procuring way in which it works certainly in the public sector and pressures in relation to payment in the private sector would make it really difficult for a business to grow exponentially in that way. So until we flip that over and we actually realise that the people doing the work, the people doing the training are these small and micro-sized businesses and not the tier one contractors, we're always going to be in this malaise of, of apprenticeship recruitment and payment. Can I just clarify before we move on to further questions? I mean, I, I don't know the detail of the, the contract in Orkney that was commented on. I mean, normally it wouldn't be just the contractor that decides to alter the design, but that would be a decision in conjunction with the design team, the employer, under whatever the terms of the contract for the contractor are. But it may highlight a difficulty uh, because a bid is made, a contract awarded on a certain design, a certain price, and then a bit further down the, loan, uh, the road, sorry, the um, design is then, perhaps for want of a better expression, dumbed down. And I'm just wondering, Robin Crawford, is that something that's part of the problem in terms of the procurement process, that there's not enough account taken of the realities of what will happen under a contract so a company can bid or a larger company can bid, get the contract, but then ultimately what is going to happen is the design will be pared down because of costs whereas other companies might bid on a basis that they could actually deliver the design as originally envisaged? Well, one of the areas in which this has been a concern is the so-called um, suicide bidding, people coming in at a very low a bid and that bid being accepted. That has been an endemic problem and I think remains a problem. And the difficulty there is that very often the contractor bidding at a very low price will then uh, seek to make a lot of savings throughout the contract. Um, and there will also be, be a lot of claims. So in part, it is a procurement issue in terms of getting the design right at the start, but also a price that is actually deliverable. If the price is not deliverable, you're going to see a lot of value engineering and you're going to see a lot of claims. 
Um, I'd like to move on now to Dean Lockhart. Thank you, Convener. I'd like to uh, ask a question about productivity and innovation in the sector. Uh, the committee's heard evidence that there are a number of factors uh, having a negative impact on productivity and innovation. We've heard about limited investment in skills, uh, limited adoption of technology and digital platforms, uh, low margins in the sector. So I'd like to get your views on uh, what, what is holding back productivity and innovation and what steps could be taken to try to improve uh, levels in the sector. If I might start, I mean, this has been an issue since earlier reports of mine. Egan and Letham focused very much on the issue of innovation within the construction sector, which um, remains an industry wedded to boots on the ground and in muddy sites. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and innovation has been hard to achieve. The Scottish, uh, the Scottish Funding Council have invested in the Construction Innovation Centre, and I think it is now making some, some progress um, in terms of a empowering innovation in Scotland or, or looking at different methods that could be increase efficiency. Um, and a lot of the issues in terms of um, prefabrication, particularly in the housing sector and uh, social housing, are, we've got some very good um, pilot schemes in Scotland where uh, innovative methods are being uh, pioneered. But there is no doubt that more can be done, and particularly on the issue of sustainability, mm. which is um, an issue that we refer to a lot in our report. Uh, because, of course, modern methods of building properly insulated buildings um, using greener methods of construction may cost a bit more at the absolute outset, but in terms of the whole of life cost of the building will prove to be very much uh, the correct decision. On that note, um, you know, the Construction Innovation Centre is a great opportunity, but there's a lack of awareness about it. Mm. You know, we quite often refer suppliers to say, you know, there's an opportunity here, and it's not just about the big projects. They can go in and get guidance on smaller things as well. But I just don't think the you know general businesses are aware that that's <coughs> there to support them. Okay, Alan, I think you wanted. To yeah, just uh, if we kind of split them into two areas, just for a moment. If you talk about productivity. Um, the time literally taken by small and micro businesses to prepare bids impacts hugely on these businesses, you know, actually preparing bids and then the issue of payment. You know, one of our members told us recently that they spend on average 12 weeks of their life, this is the director, per year chasing payment. You know, and that's a proportion that's probably expanded in each single business. So they are using the productivity in the wrong ways. They're using it to chase money and debts and yeah. retention sums, and they're using it to formulate bids, you know, which is it ultimately might not even be successful. If we look at innovation, I think the industry is, is better. In our sector, engineering sector, uh, particularly in the electrical industry, we are now undertaking training on electrical vehicle installation charging points, uh, battery storage. Um, we've done training in relation to um, other aspects of renewables, um, uh, solar PV panels, etc. But often having that training is not enough. The client then has to lead that through their tender. And some local authorities are quite good at that. They will put requirements in for minimum numbers of installations of certain things. But to ask a tier one contractor to simply say, well, in our design, we feel it should be X, doesn't often happen. It's the client would say X. And then, as, as Jeanette said earlier, often that X is valued and engineered out because of the cost of the budget overall. Okay. Jeanette, do you want to? Um, yes, thank you. I currently sit on the governance board of the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre. And um, I, in my short journey um, and our time there, have been incredibly encouraged by the amount of SMEs who are engaging with the centre and coming up with all kinds of uh, advanced technology um, and, and innovative ideas to drive either productivity or greater effectiveness in the sector that they're in. Um, and uh, we currently have two products which are um, going through the centre, so I'm aware of the cost to an SME of that type of engagement, and that's certainly an area where we should look to assist um, in any way um, the government can, uh, because it is 
there is huge potential there, not only to invest in uh, projects for Scotland, but to invest in companies who have huge potential to then go on to export um, within Britain and abroad. Mm. Um, if, I, if I could just um, uh, show you one particular product, it's always good to have something to look like look at instead yeah, that's of. That's great. Yeah, um, please go ahead. Um, not that I'm giving any trade secrets away, um, but this is an example of a, a product that we're developing for in introduction into schools and education and particularly early um, learning centres. Um, and it, this is a, a, a sophisticated glass product. Um, it's safety glass um, and it can be used to perform for acoustic sound and fire internally. But we're playing around with all sorts of graphic applications and interlayers within laminations of glass and um, for sort of high visual and sensory um, mm. development in these early learning centres and schools. You can see the effect of what happens when I turn the glass all right, very around. good. Okay. Um, so we're, <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure how we get that into Exactly. Yes. With great difficulty. I like to give a challenge to yeah. committees like these. Um, but this is an example of something that um, we're working on. And um, uh, I've been told that I cannot get assistance um, in lots of, even engaging with um, Scottish Enterprise. There's lots of parts of that journey that there are significant gaps um, and because of the nature of the the types of um, um, things that can be supported and things that can't, mm -hmm. there's major gaps that I would be expected as a company to fund myself. Um, and that's just down to the profit levels that I can achieve in right. any one year. So we're stifling a lot of potential innovation within SMEs. And would you, are there any simple steps uh, sector bodies or the government could take to support best practice in the sector, highlight best practice and um, fund it where necessary? Yes, there, I think there's lots of ways that we could do that, is, is by asking the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre to perhaps prepare some examples of situations that companies in, are in right now, because they will differ. It's just so that we could get an idea of the, the, the steps on that journey that could be better supported. Things like applying for a patent attorney. Um, these are all quite significant fees um, that slow down the progress of these innovations until you can afford it or spread it over five years when perhaps with a little assistance it could be done and delivered to the industry much quick, quicker. Okay. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. And now Gordon MacDonald. Uh, I've got a few follow-up questions that I, I want to ask. Um, in terms of early contractor involvement, um, we've, we've heard uh, a lot of evidence about the benefits, and I think there was a suggestion that the Commonwealth Village in Glasgow was, was part of that early uh, engagement. Can you say why we're not making more use of those frameworks? To be honest with you, it is a cultural change that's required. You know, the construction industry has been working off these procurement models and payment models and questions like retention for 100 plus years. Mm -hmm. And to change that means a significant change in culture. Now, there is the carrot and there is the stick, mm -hmm. you know, and I think both have to be used together. You know, I think that is an exemplar uh, project and I think more could be made to, to highlight that to the industry. And certainly, I would suggest that the government should be taking the lead, showing leadership and, and using that as, as an example for all of the projects that they directly fund. That would be a, a step in the right direction and, and hopefully that will then effectively percolate its way down the rest of the contractual and construction industry. But things have to be shown to work and that was, a, was an example of where it did work. You know, But I don't think we've made enough of that in the construction industry and, I, and include ourselves amongst that. We probably don't promote that enough as well. Should that be a question we ask of the Scottish Futures Trust when they're in front of the committee about why they don't use that, bearing in mind they're the delivery model for, for the hub codes, etc.? I think it'd be useful to ask them that, you know, and, and, and I think we all have to be engaged in that. You know, it's not just the it's not the Scottish Futures Trust, it's the industry as a whole. Mm -hmm. We have to become involved in that and give these more information out, more details, more examples. And we all have different ways of communicating, both with our own 
businesses, members, and the, the trade as, as a whole. Uh, and you know, we need to make and uh, take an opportunity of doing that. Okay. Uh, in terms of um, innovation and improved productivity. Much of the uh, materials that are used on Scottish uh, construction sites are imported. Is there a, a need to um, build into frameworks or contracts a standardisation of product that can be used or materials that can be used so that suppliers can become more efficient and build more productive um, methods of manufacturing, say, door handles or, or, or bricks or breeze blocks or whatever it happens to be, because they know there is a pipeline of projects that are going to use these materials. Would that be beneficial? Um, yes, I think so. Um, some of the work the Supplier Development Programme has done has been working on things like Citydale. So when that was first announced, um, we worked on raising awareness about what Citydale was about, because a lot of small suppliers said, this has got nothing to do with me. All the big contractors are going to get involved in that. But it was about opening up the supply <coughs> chain and also looking how they go down that route towards it. Um, I think it's back to specification again. The earlier a, a contractor can be brought in or a small business can be brought in to understand what's being bought um, is definitely very beneficial. We worked on a, a programme with Scottish Government which looked at spend data to understand where spend in Scotland was going. Um, and there was a, a, a good trial that we did that looked at a product that could identify where spend was going out of Scotland, and that could be drilled down by local authority area. Um, and it was really interesting to see how that could maybe beneficially help Scotland identify what suppliers we've got, because I think there's a challenge there as well. We don't always know, or the procurer doesn't always know, what manufacturers, businesses are in their local area or in the wider area that they could actually be connecting with to go out to tender on. Um, the bigger companies are very aware of that. They have all the systems in place. They can find out about these opportunities. They've got teams of people. But there might be a small local business that could actually deliver your door handles. But how do you know about them? How do they connect with you? Um, we recently ran an event with South Lanarkshire Council, which was a meet the real buyer. So not only did the small suppliers come in to meet the procurers, but they were meeting the actual commissioners. So within the authority, the actual people that were specifying and buying things, and that raised awareness of what businesses were there locally. Um, so I do believe that market awareness is really important and how the public sector find out and engage to ensure that. This comes back to the sustainable procurement duty as well. You know That is built into the regulations when you're looking to try and find local uh, contractors to find contractors. How can that be used more to go down the supply chain and not just, you know, at the first level? Robin Crawford. Yeah, much has been um, said about frameworks thus far, and of course, um, the development of specific Scottish frameworks um, does uh, contain a lot of, or does have a lot of potential for Scotland. Um, if we had more frameworks um, available in Scotland. Um, looking at Scottish supply chains, um, frameworks have a lot of advantages in terms of allowing synergies right down the supply chain, companies starting to work together on a more regular basis, and also I think they provide the opportunity for more innovation because companies are working together on a framework and perhaps um, identifying better local sourcing. It's clearly very much better if you can locally source, not just from the standpoint of um, the promotion of the local economy and the sustainability, particularly of remote and rural mm -hmm. um, parts of the economy, which we regarded in our report, the construction sector as having a very important um, role in doing, but also in the whole area of um, getting um, better products, um, get cheaper products, because if, if you're using local source, it should be cheaper than bringing stuff from uh, a long distance away. Yeah. Just on that last point, I mean, you know, the Scottish Government has ambitious climate change targets. Should we be building into procurement frameworks that there should be a weighting given to the carbon cost of producing and transporting products to site? Would that help the Scottish uh, manufacturing industry if we did that? Well, it's, it's one factor which has to be borne in mind. You've, you've obviously got to make sure that the product is the correct product for the particular mm -hmm. build. But I think it's important that you do bear in mind all these um, elements of cost. Right. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you, John Mason.
Uh, thanks very much, convener. Um, I think we're heading now towards winding up, so I just want to kind of give you all maybe a final question. We've, we've focused on procurement, but clearly I, I know a number of you are quite knowledgeable about the wider uh, issues facing construction as well as that. So I just kind of wanted maybe to go through, if you could all give me one or two, just two things that you think we should also be looking at. Um, I mean, Brexit is the obvious one. Is that having an impact on the construction sector? I mean, we've kind of touched on things like off-site uh, construction. Uh, we visited some of us uh, an off-site uh, construction site recently, and we were told that, for example, one council will give planning permission, but another council has said if it's got to be real bricks. We're not accepting off-site construction as part of the planning process. So, so is planning an issue? I realise there's a whole lot of things in there, but just to give you each the opportunity, maybe start with Mr Crawford. Well, I think the one thing I would say, you know, moving away from the procurement uh, exercise itself, is the issue of quality, quality of build. We've seen a number of examples of, of uh, poor quality builds um, uh, where significant problems with the building have, have resulted. And I think there needs to be more work, and I know that more work is in fact being done in studying um, this issue of quality and how public authorities control the quality during the build phase mm -hmm. to ensure that uh, we don't have a lot of these issues arising which have been well publicised in Scotland in, uh, in recent months. Thank you. Ms Cameron? Um, I don't know that I can comment on the, the construction side, but certainly from the training aspect, I think there's a long way to go to make sure that um, SMEs are trained, um, especially in the, the procurement process. Um, a lot of them are averse to even getting involved in it because they think it's too onerous. Um, and there's no doubt that there is a, a steps to go through and there's documentation to put in. But I think once they've learned that skill, they can reuse that many times with every public body. So there is a benefit to that. Um, and we're constrained by the resources we have. I have a team of four people. Um, we're very small, and yet we cover the whole of Scotland. Um, and the construction centre, you know, we were in the review. Um, we were named in that, but we've not had any additional funding on the back of that review to grow and do more with the sector, which we would like to do. So I think training is a big part of this. Okay. I certainly get small businesses in my constituency who I might benefit from you, so yes. I'll be sending them your way. Excellent. Um, <laughs> Mr Wilson? Uh, yeah, can I finish with uh, a plea for the committee to look at four Ps? Uh, those Ps are procurement to change the traditional model, which is not working. Payment, to make more use of project bank accounts and to protect uh, sums of retention and trust. Professionalism, to make sure, and this is back to Robin's point, quality. It's all too easy for businesses to enter the construction industry. There is really no limit to businesses, and I think there more has to be done in relation to that. And we already have a very good government scheme, the approved Certifier of Construction Scheme, which sets down criteria for businesses and individuals in that regard, so I think more should be made of that. And finally, policing. Uh, there are pieces of legislation there just now which are being uh, mandated. Uh, the Procurement Reform Act places an obligation on public sector bodies, including local authorities, to check to see whether payment terms are being pushed down the, the um, procurement chain, down to, to tier twos and threes. Uh, we've got a research paper in front of me just now that suggests that only 25% of any public body are taking any action in relation to chasing those. So I think where there is legislation in place, uh, let's make sure that it's actually uh, policed. And the, the introduction of a, of a procurement or construction regulator, in my opinion, would go some way towards that. So four Thank Ps you. from me. That's great. Ms McIntyre, better glass. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would just like to conclude by... Um, really reiterating the emphasis that's been placed on um, the importance of having expert knowledge at procurement stage and construction. I think it is uh, essential that we keep hold of the key drivers of any building um, and, and hold on to the responsibilities and a bit of the risk at that point, uh, because um, there is far too much emphasis at the moment on the cost to build the building, i.e. simply the construction phase, and not enough emphasis being put on uh, what the building is being asked to do um, thereafter um, through its whole life value. And it takes um, considerable expertise um, at the outset to hold on to these 
uh, key drivers all the way through. That's great. Thanks very much. That's, that's super. Okay. All right. Thank you very much to all of our witnesses for coming in today. Um, I'll now suspend the meeting uh, to allow us to change over to the next panel of... Um, thank you. enjoying themselves too much. We'll now move to the next item on the agenda for today, which is item number five, which is, again, subordinate legislation, the Inspire EU Exit Scotland Amendment Regulations 2019. Uh, I'll welcome Kate Forbes, Minister for Public Finance and Digital Economy, and uh, also uh, Shona Nicol, who is with her. And I'll invite the Minister to make an opening statement of two minutes. Thank you, Convener, and as this is a quite a technical SSI, I will take the opportunity. The Inspire regulations implement an EU directive which established infrastructure for spatial information because member states are required to operate national spatial data infrastructures using common standards that make spatial data easy to find, use and reuse. And as a government and as a parliament, indeed, we want to make uh, decisions and have policies that are based on high quality data and we want to use that data to create value for Scotland. These INSPIRE regulations make sure that there is a national spatial data infrastructure that uses common standards and that there is therefore consistency. Now, our understanding is that the INSPIRE legislation is currently functioning well. There are over 750 records eh, online on the Discovery Portal, and those standards underpin a number of online public sector services, such as Scotless and Scotland's Environment Web. There are business impacts. The UK government has estimated that there's about six to £11 billion pounds, um, per annum benefit of um, exploiting and using data more efficiently. And for example, those standards will be used to report on the spatial elements of the UN sustainability development goals to fulfil the First Minister's commitment. Our aim throughout Brexit is to keep delivering those benefits for the people of Scotland. And that is why I'm proposing to make the amendments detailed in the SSI to correct deficiencies in the 2009 Scottish Inspire regulations that will come about as a result of Brexit so that that framework continues to function effectively. And I should say that that SSI builds on the changes that were made to the UK government's equivalent Inspire regulations before Christmas. This statutory instrument corrects similar deficiencies and I gave my consent with the Parliament's approval for Scottish matters to be included in this instrument. The UK government has been consulted on the proposed amendments to the Inspire Scotland regulations 2009 and have raised no concerns, but I'd be happy to take any questions from the committee. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, questions from members. Uh, Andy Whiteman. 
Uh, thanks very much indeed, committee, uh, convener. Um, <laughs> um, in, um, in, uh, in your amendment regulation, um, in section 10, you are substituting uh, a whole new section of regulation 15 in the original regulations. Um, section 15 in the original regulations say that Scottish ministers have the following functions. Enforcing the requirements of regulations 7 and 8. 7 is about metadata, 8 is about network services. So that's your functions in relationship to the existing directive. In the amended version, where you're substituting the whole of regulation 15, it says that Scottish ministers must, for the purpose of ensuring compliance, ensure that appropriate structures and mechanisms are put in place for coordinating the contributions of all persons, etc. And you talk about coordination. There's nothing about the duties that were originally imposed by Regulation 15, which is about enforcement. That strikes me as a weakening of the regulation, and yet my understanding is that this regulation is being brought forward basically to keep the statute book consistent with a pre Brexit situation. Yeah, um, and I'll ask Shona if she's got anything um, technical to add to that. But my understanding is that in terms of the, the core duties of Scottish ministers, there is no um, specific changes. But I'll ask Shona because it's. Yeah, I would agree um, uh, with Ms. Forbes there. I mean, there's only one slight thing I can point to, which was there were changes um, in um, Inspire in 2012. So there was amendment um, in 2012 which changed Regulation uh, 15. Um, to be about ensuring compliance rather than enforcement. So that actual change from enforcement to ensuring compliance, um, I think, came about in the 2012 regulations. Does that...? OK, thanks very much. Yeah, this is a complicated area. I hadn't yeah. realised there'd been amendments there. So you're, you're, you can assure me, therefore, that your Section 10 here is amending the latest Inspire regulation Sorry, to be consistent with it? Yeah. OK, thank you. And in terms of the expectations on uh, public bodies and the expectations when it comes to monitoring and the expectations on Scottish ministers, we do not deem that there is um, a, any significant changes. We're trying to sort of replicate like for like with uh, this SSI. Yeah, thanks. All right. Um, the convener is, of course, nothing without the committee, Mr Whiteman. <laughs> um, any further questions from committee members? Um, if not, I'll move to the formal debate on the motion to approve the affirmative instrument, and uh, I would invite the Minister to formally move the motion. Formally moved. Um, does any member wish to speak in the debate on the motion? If not, um, I will uh, put the question. The question is that the motion S5M15750 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Um, that is agreed, uh, and in light of the timing, I'll invite the committee again to agree that I, as convener and the clerk, should produce a short factual report of the committee's decision and arrange to have it published. Are we agreed with that? Yes. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. The light of your morning. <laughs> you, you, you managed in under two minutes. So. Did I? <laughs> thank, thank you. I'll suspend the meeting now.
We now turn to item 7 on our agenda for this morning, uh, returning to our constru construction in Scotland's economy inquiry, and uh, we have a fresh panel of witnesses. Uh, in no particular order, we have uh, Fiona Harper, Director of BSE Skills Limited, Ian Hughes, Partnerships Director, um, Scotland Construction Industry Training Board, Fiona Stewart, Head of National Training Programmes for Skills Development Scotland, Professor Sean Smith, Director of Sustainable Construction at Napier University, and Maureen Douglas, HR Director for the Forster Group. So welcome to all five of you. Thank you for coming in this morning. Now, I would look, just like to start with um, some questions about a comment made by the Institution of Civil Engineers that the construction sector in Scotland suffers from what they say is fragmented and unsustainable supply chain relationships and also that there's a problem with limited investment in skills. Does that um, sound correct to any of you, or do you have comment to make on that? And again, I should say, don't feel that you have to answer every single question. We'll uh, just move the discussion along as people come in and out and come to other questions from members of the committee. And the sound desk will operate the sound system, so no need to press any buttons. Um, who would like to come in on that? Ian Hughes? <coughs> yes, in terms of, terms of the latter statement, uh, limited investment in skills, I think this is, this is interesting in terms of the organisations which do invest within construction skills, and at the present time, that's primarily CITB and, and Skills Development Scotland, so colleagues from government. Um, in financial terms, uh, we invest roughly 10% of our £350 million budget in Scotland within skills. Um, and we are the largest modern apprenticeship training investor as well, uh, alongside Scottish Government. So the lack of investment in skills um, really leads to a further question, does that and has that created a skills gap, or has that created an underqualified and unskilled workforce? And I think in terms of the underskilled and underqualified workforce, yes, we have an issue in Scotland, we have by far the largest unqualified workforce amongst older workers in particular across GB. So there are certainly areas in terms of investment within the older workforce we would like to have a closer look at in terms of our priorities moving forward. In terms of a fragmented supply chain, I think you've probably heard uh, numerous stories to date around procurement, around the relationship between tier ones, two, threes and fours. So I think in terms of the, whether that's fragmented or whether that's broken, um, I would defer to my colleague uh, at the table here from the construction sector itself, who has more first-hand experience of what that actually means on the ground. But clearly we often um, get customers saying to us from the SME and micro sectors in particular that they are being squeezed continually in terms of time getting paid um, or the amount getting paid or issues of retention, which I'll not go over, I think, was probably dealt with this morning. So I think there are issues there that do need closer scrutiny. Right. B before I come to Maureen Douglas, I mean, do you, do you think that what's being done is enough to address the number of construction workers that will be retiring in Scotland over the next decade, estimated at 30,000? And uh, the, other, the other aspect of this is, you know, the, the economy comes and goes, as it were, including for the, the construction sector. Um, is there something that can be done to feather out training during periods of, of uh, downturn so that we then have <coughs> the skilled workers or the construction workers we need when there's the upturn again? I think 30,000 skilled workers retiring is one part of the picture. The, the churn, basically, of new entrants, people coming into industry and people retiring, Actually, our research, which was carried out for the first time across Scotland regions uh, this year and last year, shows that certain occupations and certain geographies um, will suffer more than others over the next three, four, five years. And I can talk about that further uh, during uh, today's session. But certainly, in terms of bringing new entrants into construction, that is a key priority in order to identify where the gaps are. Um, People talk about skills gaps being created. It's, it's a glass half empty phrase. Um, our research shows there are 6,000 
job opportunities that need filling in Scotland over the coming years across various occupations and various geographies. Part of our job as a training body is to make sure that the pipeline of talent coming through, particularly from school but not exclusively, is the right pipeline to fill these job opportunities. Uh, Maureen Douglas. Thank you. There's uh, a lot of uh, points in there, so mm. hopefully I'll, I'll cover them all off. Just a little context, then. I'm from an, an SME. Um, we cover uh, Scotland. We directly employ 150 employees, and we have created our own skills academy um, and apprenticeship framework. So, um, so I'm coming with the SME experience, if you like. So um, I'll, I'll touch on your original question, Gordon. Whilst that is not our experience in terms of investment in skills. That's not our experience of the sector. I do recognise the comment made. Um, and again, regarding the supply chain, as an industry, I'm, I actually don't think we are fragmented. Um, I think we have different problems um, and we can't find a solution collectively to those problems. So the tier one contractor has a very different skills challenge to the, the SME. So let's just um, think about who services our sector. 98% of the construction industry are SMEs, of which 91% are micro. And I think it's really important to understand that when we're talking about how to address the, the skills challenges. So the perception that we don't train, I think, comes from the, the feelings of frustration that we don't have the skills at the time that we need them. Because actually, construction is the, I think it's the most popular framework for apprenticeships. We're really good at apprenticeships. I spend a lot of time in other areas of the UK, and everybody looks at the Scottish model and the construction industry and the apprenticeship framework, and it's phenomenal. It is the envy, but it is only one solution. And I think the opportunities to us as a nation is to build on that good work that we do around the craft apprenticeships, but to extend that beyond to give us other forms of apprenticeship which are coming through now, through the foundation apprenticeship, through the graduate apprenticeship, and then as Ian touched on, create pathways that allow us to take a trade or a professional in one sector transition across to another so then we can deal with the peaks and troughs of the construction industry which is you know I work mainly in house building they're either building lots of houses or if recession come they, they, they don't, don't build any so where do those people go so I think the opportunities lie there so um, I think as an industry we do train and um, but we're frustrated that perhaps we don't have the skills and that's the that's the area I think we should focus our attentions on all right. Um, thank you. I'll move on to Andy Whiteman. I should say, if you want to come in at any point, please just indicate with your hand, and I'll try to bring you in as, as appropriate. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks um, very much, Convener. Um, Ian Hughes, you talked about 6,000 job vacancies. Um, I think we have figures that suggest 35% of vacancies in the construction industry are hard to fill due to the lack of available skills. But basically, why is this, and has it changed over the last 10, 15 years? Do I think both want to come in on that? Yeah, <coughs> yeah I think in terms of uh, the quality of applicants, not the, not the volumetrics, we still have substantial <coughs> number of applicants for vacancies within apprenticeships, for example. What we're hearing from the, our customer base, the, the, the employer, is that the quality of, of the applicants isn't as strong as it would have been in the past. You know, there, are, there are some areas, um, I'm, I'm thinking about Highlands and Islands in particular, whereby the volumetrics, the numbers are down. There is no doubt about that. Central Belt, you, you, if you have a roofing <laughs> apprentice advertised, you will get two or 300 applica applications for that one apprenticeship. I think the sift, basically, of the, the, the talent that's coming through from the, the education system is something that we, that we need to have a close look at uh, in terms of a career strategy to address some of these issues. I think in terms of employers struggling to get the right qual quality of applicant needs to be addressed within 
our education and further education system as well. So th this is evidence we are getting uh, in many cases that the, the, the volume matrix are still there. It's still, uh, I'm sure Maureen would agree, an apprenticeship is still seen as a cherry within construction for a young person in particular, but we are just not seeing in many occupations the quality of applicants coming through, and that creates that percentage gap that you mentioned. I know one or two others want to come in on this, but just pursuing that, you're saying that in the central belt, 200 to 300 applications for one, I think it was apprenticeship opportunity? Yes, sir. Like, it's not uh, unusual, no. And, and, which is not unusual? Yeah. Um, but you're saying out of those 200 and 300, you struggle to find a quality applicant? The, 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 there's, there's a sift, basically, that goes through that employers, any employer within any sector, wants the best individuals uh, for their business. Um, and what employers are telling us over the past 10 years, they, they've seen a downturn in the quality of the applicants coming through who are looking for an apprenticeship. So the challenge, the challenge we have as a training body is if we look at those figures and we have <clears throat> 100 applicants for a roofing apprenticeship and one gets the job, the challenge for me is what do we do with the other 99 in terms of keeping them interested and keeping them active in moving into construction? So they've shown an interest to get into the sector. They just haven't crossed the line in terms of the competitive routes in there. However, do they fall off a cliff edge at that point or is there something we can do to spend more time with them, work closer with them, to get them over the line with another company or the same company. That, that's the challenge we are facing in terms of the, the large number of learners within the system. I think we have to bear in mind within the FE sector alone, in Scotland there are 20,000 learners studying construction uh, at FE College in any year. 2,000 modern apprentices, 18,000 other learners. That cohort, that talent pipeline, I think it's something we need to have a close look at in terms of moving them into the construction industry to fill some of the gaps uh, and vacancies that were that were talked about earlier on. So are they not going into construction just now then? I know government's looking at research to identify um, uh, the, 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 the direction that these learners go in. We carried out the research uh, in uh, England last year. We couldn't get the data in Scotland and Wales. It wasn't available. So, so this year, hopefully, we will see destination points for these construction learners. What we're hearing from the SME sector in particular and the construction sector is they're not moving into that space. So where are they going, I suppose, is the question. And I suppose part of our role is if they're not moving into construction, if they're not employable within the sector, why not? And what do we need to do to address some of those issues? Okay. I think Maureen, you were... Thank you. Um, there's absolutely no challenge around volume um, of entrants coming into the sector. And as Ian said, there's already 20,000 people on full-time education um, wanting to get into the sector. And the transition rates are unknown, but work's underway to find out why, why they're not. Um, I would go right back to secondary school as an employer if I were to say, when do we start filtering and channeling um, our, our young people? And we have a very traditional vocational academic approach. And that in itself means that there's a very narrow funnel of uh, talent that ends up going down that particular channel. And that's partly, I believe, one of the reasons why we have very little diversity um, in, our, in our workforce, and that presents one of the greatest opportunities to us. So if we can change the way in which we enable people to experience a sector, whether it's construction in the built environment or another, in the secondary school level through an alternative form of learning, then what we will have is young people that are work ready and have the skills and capabilities that employers are looking for, and then we'll adapt to whatever skills are required in the industry. What we do just now is we train people to do a job. You're a joiner. You're a surveyor, you work in public, you work in private, we're very narrow. And if we can change our approach to education and change how we approach the reskilling and retraining once people are in employment, I think we can do wonderful things with the, with the skills and the, the construction industry that we have. Um, but we do have to look at it differently. I wonder if I could ask Fiona Stewart from Skills to... Yeah, so I think 
And also Fiona Harbour, perhaps after Fiona Stewart wanted to come in as well. Given even you're the government body responsible for this, why, <laughs> why is there such a shortage of skilled workers? I would say every year we um, train 6,000 um, apprentices. Um, last year we had 6,104 people entering the industry. As, a, uh, as an apprentice. Not all of those individuals are new entrants. Many of them are already employed and you know, they're either you know, upskilling um, or they're coming from other industries and re retraining. Or they're um, being trained at a higher level in leadership and management, certainly sort of many of the older um, cohort. And that you know, obviously improves the industry going forward. In terms of um, young people, we in Skills Development Scotland obviously have Foundation Apprenticeships, which is a fairly new product. It's been going for a few years and it's beginning to address some of the diversity issues that we've got in the industry. For example, Foundation Apprenticeships in the sort of construction area, 13.1% are female. So that's a big rise from modern apprenticeships where there's only 1% of females choosing that route. And remember, that's vocational education. Many females enter the construction industry but go into the industry at higher level jobs through further education or higher education. And in fact, university um, participation by female is something like 39%. So the higher the qualification, more attractive it is to female participants. The MA programme itself is open um, to you know, people of all backgrounds and gender and ethnicity. Um, but sometimes it's difficult because, you know, it's a, a mobile labour market, it's a mo mobile labour. Individuals, female um, participants don't necessarily want, you know, to travel from Glasgow to Dundee every day, you know, to work. So the terms and conditions don't tend to lend themselves particularly well to female participation, particularly for older female workers. In terms of entrance into the industry, we are looking at, um, in school, creating new pathways for young people at lower levels, so SCQF 4 and 5, for young people who perhaps wouldn't make it in the industry through the traditional routes, trying to offer you know, different vocational pathways for those young people to make a, a, a start in the industry and then to progress you know, either on to foundation apprenticeship or then on to the main modern apprenticeship or graduate apprenticeship. Some young people don't um, relate well to you know, the types of learning you get in school. They don't do well with chalk and talk and vocational learning is actually something which enthuses, enthuses them and you know, makes them you know, light up and you know, can be successful in a career that they perhaps never thought of. And so those pathways you know, we hope will help with that. So I would say in terms of attracting talent into the industry, I would say government are making big inroads um, in terms of looking at particular learning styles and offering pathways. And as the government agency, Skills Development Scotland, is looking at innovation and trying to bring you know, new ways of attracting labour. And most importantly, we can't do any of this without engaging employers. And you know, as Maureen has pointed out, the industry is made up with SMEs. Most of our um, apprentices are employed with SMEs. And so it's very important to attract employers and to enthuse employers and get them to aspire to um, creating their own talent pipelines, um, so investing in young people. As an industry, in our sector in Scotland, it is the only sector where there is huge levels of both private and public investment. 22% of apprenticeships are in construction in Scotland, so it is an industry which you know, both employers and the public sector you know, take um, you know, sort of great account of and you know are investing for the future. Okay, thank you. Fiona Harper, we wanted to um, yes, um, BSE Skills is a, a new organisation. Um, we have been part of the building services engineering sector. Uh, that's plumbers, ele electricians, heating and ventilation, refrigeration trades. Um, we had a, a sector skills council that um, uh, came to a sticky end and as we all collaborated in Scotland, this is three trade associations, Select, SNPF and BISA, we, collaborate, we decided we would continue to collaborate and that we wanted to take a, a very um, 
detailed, in-depth uh, participation of what skills and training is offered in our industry. That's not to say this was new, This we've always done this, but working alongside organisations like Summit Skills, SDS, SQA. So we, we set up this new company. Um, it's quite unique uh, in that it's run by three trade associations. It has three directors and one consultant, and that's it. Our remit is simply to look at qualifications, national occupational standards, and modern apprenticeship frameworks. Um, but underneath all that, there are three trade associations that, that feel very passionately about their industry and the people who work in that industry, be the employers or employees. Um, my side of the business is looking at the skills and training. Uh, your question was, where do these people come from? Um, in Electrotechnical, <coughs> Our training provider would argue that they are inundated with applications, but they too would say that the quality of the applications has, has fallen, um, and it is harder to do that sift that Ian was referring to. Um, but that doesn't mean to say the quality is still good. It's not as good as it was. It's not empirical evidence. It, it, it's an opinion that's expressed. We very recently, with our English colleagues, uh, conducted an LMI um, for the first time in our industry, and that was in the electrotechnical sector. Um, and that intelligence came back saying that there is a difference in young people. They are looking for different things. They don't particularly like this idea of travelling, which has been mentioned by other panellists. And so there probably has to be another look at how people are employed in the industry and what we're expecting from them. But as far as the training goes, what came through uh, in this labour market intelligence is that electrotechnical is a sustainable occupation. People come in and they stay and they progress through the industry. They come in as an apprentice and they stay, they go into management and often become owner, owners, company owners. So we know that we are doing well. Uh, whether or not that fills the skills gap is, is a difficult question to ask. All our, our answer, all our apprentices are employed by employers on direct hire. And, um, and, and the companies have to sustain that throughout. It's a four-year apprenticeship and it is something that they want to do to sustain the industry. Uh, and that's where we, we, we focus our, our attention. Mo foundation apprenticeships for us are difficult in the context of health and safety aspects, but we do run our own pre-apprenticeship programmes. We have an MPA, uh, the National Progression Award, that covers all three sectors, um, but that's not funded, so it's very difficult to encourage young people and their families to, to become involved, or employers for that matter. And Thank you. I think we'll, I, perhaps I should say, of course, we've limited time, so if, if we can, um, committee members, um, short, sharp questions, and perhaps if also in response, uh, try to focus on the key points that you, you think are there and uh, be brief in answers. So I'll, I'll move, turn now to John Mason. Uh, thanks very much, Convener, and uh, I think to build on some of the questions that uh, um, Andy Whiteman was asking, and especially around diversity, so, um, I mean, it is disappointing to me reading the figures that, and I take the point that I think Ms Stewart made that at the higher and FE level there are more women coming in, but I mean, 1% of entrance does come across as pretty grim. And I mean, we see other sectors like, say, the police, who were predominantly male, making quite big steps forward in bringing more women in. So is there really nothing more we can do to increase this 1%? Mrs. Douglas? It's an absolute tragedy, um, to be fair. And I, I work in the sector and, uh, and I'm appalled. But a slight history lesson. I mean, we've created this. Um, industry itself has, has created and sustained this. Um, and unlike other sectors, we haven't made the shift to, to change because um, we well, won't go back to the 18th century where apprenticeships were run by parishes. But prior to the World Wars, it was very common to see women in as bricklayers, um, as carpenters, as, as craftswomen, as and craftsmen. It's very, very very common, and particularly in the rural locations. And the, the wars came, and, and we all know um, what happened when they came back from the war, and the role um, of women particularly changed. And um, from that grew um, 
organizations and institutions and as an industry we became very narrow so the, you the, jo the joiners the plumbers the electricians the professionals the architects they all have their own little bodies and uh, and develop their own qualifications and we all know recruitment you typically employ the person that looks and, and represents you so we end up with a white male predominantly this sorry if that's slightly contentional but we end up with an industry that looks like what it looks like and with not much of a desire to really, really fundamentally shift and change that. So so how do we do that? And I so, so when you say a lack of desire, is that on the part of maybe small employers, for example? I or? think it's a blend of um, absolutely employers have the responsibility because they take on. Um, but you know what you know. And with our industry being small micro as it is, it's very difficult um, to, uh, to change those behaviours um, without changing something first. And for me, to, sorry, you did ask for a short answer, Gordon. So I'll get to the point. Um, I'll get to the point. Uh, to, for me, it's the talent pipeline. If we can provide a, a more diverse range of talent coming through into the sector, through I, I think the foundation apprenticeships are phenomenal um, and really exciting. But coming into the sector and um, through a variety of different pathways, so that those people coming through reflect the communities within which we work, and it's not just obviously about women, then we will gain confidence with employers to then take on and to okay, then shift right. it. Um, I'll maybe move on to one of the others. Yes, I mean, it, although I've mentioned women, I mean, I'm also interested that uh, BME yeah. uh, underrepresented as well. And I mean, who, who's, who, who can change this? Is, is it the schools? Is it the families? Is it the peers? Or is it just everybody? Uh, Ms. Harper? Uh, Everybody. <laughs> um, we, we firmly believe that the schools uh, and careers advisors can help. Uh, we run a competition uh, in um, this area in Lothians in Edinburgh, and it's a combination of work from uh, training providers, universities and colleges. And it's a skills competition, and it, it's uh, tasks um, that are fun in terms of electrotechnical heating and ventilating. They have to make water go through a pipe. They have to make a light turn on, um, build a, um, a, a roof, all sorts of things. And it's great, great fun. And it's aimed at S4 pupils. And it's the number of girls that are there and how they work with the boys um, as teams, not as girls and boys, but as teams, and they enjoy it. And if we could roll that out with the help of the schools, careers, SDS, two other parts of the country, it's got to influence young people and how they approach this industry and what it offers. I mean, some of the colleges we had in a previous session were... Um in, at least in first year, teaching the girls separately from the boys because they felt that was advantageous. Is that something you think is worthwhile? I see Miss Douglas shaking her head, but I'll take that as a... You don't even <laughs> say anything. Well, okay. sadly, Maureen won't be happy with me saying this, but we are trying to encourage West College Scotland with SDS to have an all-girls class to see oh, right, if that okay. helps. Right. Um, uh, I think from our industry point of view, I need to make it clear to all of you that there are no barriers if a girl applies the problem is getting the girls to apply or other ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. Do you think the name construction is an issue? I mean, I'm not a fan of just changing the name of things to give a different image, but, you know, and I think and my colleague actually will talk more about image later on, but does that make a difference? Um, right, Professor Smith. Um, I think we need to look at why is it increased, why has there been a more diverse workforce increasing in the higher levels, you know, at universities and colleges, and maybe to learn some of the elements from that. Um, you've had some key role models from the sector, uh, from women in the sector who've come into particular positions. We see them in the press, we see them in the television, that all helps. And um, we're not seeing that at the trades area. In terms of a survey in 2016 by Keep Moat, when they asked uh, young women how did they see the construction sector, would they work in it, and, and about, I think it was 24 or 29% said they thought construction was only on site. So coming yes. back to your terminology, um, when there's so many other clean tech and engineering and other type roles out there, I think that the sector probably needs to widen that reach of 
what it's saying and what the messages are. Do you think if there was more off-site construction, for example, that might draw off people? Off-site has might been regarded by many as an opportunity, mm -hmm. um, particularly through the, the flexibility of other operations around work, of people having families and various other things and shift patterns. But, but as we know, it's not a panacea. We've seen in the car industry in America how that shifted significantly to have more female workers. However, then it shifted back. And I think there's an understanding as why did it shift, why did it reduce again in America? Um, don't have the answer to that, but mm -hmm. you know, it worked in one way, but then it fell back. Okay. Mr Hughes, you want to come in? I think, I think I would agree with colleagues in terms of that talent pipeline. Um, it's, 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 it's quite shocking that any sector um, has 50% of its potential talent pipeline not involved in the sector in terms of recruitment. It's a huge waste, in my opinion, uh, missed opportunity. We are planning to put together a substantial uh, career strategy in Scotland, working with colleagues in Skills Development Scotland. And we have to look at these, this type of strategy over a four, five, six year period. It's not a quick fix. Um, and, th and, there will be, and then there are four strands, in my opinion, to any career strategy to, to attract and, and diversify the workforce. Um, there's the use of digi digital and social media. There's the use of experience, hands-on um, work with uh, young people in particular. There's the use of ambassadors, which was touched upon, uh, role models. Um, and there's the use of marketing campaign, hearts and minds type approach. So when you get that blend right, and you look at it over a sustained period, and you can measure the impact it's having in terms of increasing those uh, population uh, cohorts who are not getting involved in construction, you have a success if it works properly. We're not doing it at the present time. It is, um, it's interesting that when you look at what's happening in the school environment, every sector is after a piece of that third year or fourth year student. Every sector, from further education, higher education, to industry itself, it's so competitive to get a part of Jimmy or Mary Smith. It's just not sustainable. So I think in terms of how we address that, in terms of the sectors which need the correct skills, which need to have the right people in place to drive the economy forward, I think it's important that we address that collectively with government and the training body to make sure uh, we, can, we can tackle this head on. OK, thanks so much. I think we'd better leave that one. I think we need to move on. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Angela Constance. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, it seems to be implied with the evidence thus far that construction uh, industry has a, a, an image problem and indeed the CITB published uh, research to, to that effect. Um, so if the witnesses accept that the construction industry has an image problem, uh, in the first instance I want to hear uh, about what industry uh, can do about that, you know, perhaps, you know, referencing uh, the pay gap or reputation for adversarial relationships uh, or unconscious bias. We'll come on to the government uh, agencies later, but I want to specifically know what industry is going to do to improve its image. Ms Douglas. Thank you, Angela. Um, so I, I would d disagree um, in, in part in that the image uh, problem, I believe, starts uh, back at school and the fact that their first experience of a construction qualification is, if it's woodwork, for example, they, you know, the task is to measure, cut and then chuck the piece of wood in the bin. That doesn't bring them into the construction experience and help them understand the broad range of careers, as you would say, had you taken uh, a project. I want, to, I want to know what industry is going to do to improve... Uh, its image. I'll come on to government okay. agencies and uh, public services in a, in a minute. Thank you, Annette. wasn't meaning to be rude, but that provides the foundation from which industry then has to build upon. So if you like, we are already getting a, a preconditioned, narrow uh, group of people into the industry. Then it's up for us as mostly small and micros to do what we can within the environment to, to create something that provides for all. But when you're typically only employing a particular cohort, it's, it's very difficult to do anything thereafter. So, so what are you proposing to do? So, so I think what 
I'm trying to say, as a small uh, micro organisations will find it very difficult in themselves to do any one thing that's going to tackle, if you like, what's institutionally um, across all different sectors, whether it's education, um, to, to make a difference. I think the solution has to come at a much higher level, whether it's the campaigns through the industry training boards, whether it's working with major contractors that have the resources that can allow the open door programs, for example. But if you were to ask me what can industry do when 98% of it's micro, I think that's, that's a huge challenge and a responsibility. And I think the responsibility actually lies elsewhere with the policy makers, the funders, the influencers, the educators, to, to then create a pipeline of talent that comes into the sector, which is then more diverse. And that in itself will culturally help businesses grow. OK, I'm not disputing the responsibility at an institutional level, but I'm keen to hear uh, some specific examples. Perhaps you can help Ian Hughes uh, with what industry can do to, to, to lead. Industry has to lead uh, with the support of organisations such as CITB in terms of our leverage and our, our investment capability. I think the image of uh, the sector is, is poor right across the board. So what you have to do in terms of rebalancing re that image is to move it into a space whereby the pathways into opportunity, which exist, you're not making things up here, it's not anecdotal. We create tens and thousands of jobs every year. We offer tens of thousands of jobs every year and they are picked up. The, image of construction for many young people in particular, and more importantly, their parents. Uh, there was a, the research carried out recently, I think 75% of parents said yes to an apprenticeship, but only 25% for my child. So, so, so that's based on, on factors such as image. Um, image basically in terms of, what does that mean? Is that the building site image? Is it the image of um, the, the guys walking down after work and, and covered in mud? Is it the image that the pay is not very good? Is it the image that the career opportunities aren't very good? These all need rebalance and redress. You can't sugarcoat the fact that building sites are dirty, hard places to work in, and why should we? However, when you look at the 270,000 jobs in construction, many of which are out with the building sites, how do we get that message across? That's image, basically. And it goes back to this pathway of job opportunities huge amount of job opportunities, career opportunities, not necessarily on the tools, on the building sites. Um, we need to rebalance what that image is. And, and, and we know, it was mentioned earlier on, my 18-year-old daughter was going through the careers conversations recently and she was given two brochures, one in construction and one in the built environment. Construction, over the shoulder, built environment looks interesting because it was pitched a different way in terms of the image and the opportunities. Okay, so what are you doing about that as, as an, an industry person, a skills person? It, it goes back to our uh, plans, which we will announce shortly in a matter of uh, weeks, to invest considerable additional money in Scotland to address aspects such as image and opportunity through careers campaigns, through direct interventions of funding uh, within the school environment with colleagues in government, not, not in isolation, but more importantly with employers around us who are able to step in um, and get that message across, whether it's ambassadors giving a story or whether it's the job opportunities which exist. So we will be investing heavily over the next three to four years of additional money um, in this specific area to try and address this. OK, we we'll look forward to hearing more about that. Um, Fiona Stewart, we've um, heard about the, the negative images and the problems with perception um, amongst uh, teachers, parents, uh, careers advisors, uh, young people themselves. Uh, so I wonder if you can outline um, in terms of the Careers Information and Advice and Guidance Service uh, what that is doing throughout every stage of our education system, starting early uh, to overcome uh, issues around negative perceptions. Okay, we have um, a digital platform, which we have My World of Work, we have Marketplace, um, we have information for in individuals, young people, so from primary school 
right through secondary school, information which is pertinent to their particular stage and the decisions that they're making about construction. If you look at what we have in My World of Work, it's a very comprehensive offering for construction. Construction is our most popular apprenticeship. We have 22% of participation in um, modern apprenticeships in construction. If it were a negative industry, uh, the perceptions were negative, we wouldn't have those people coming into those apprenticeship places. We have a we have greater demand than we have supply of places um, in terms of employment opportunities. For every one job, there'll be six applicants, at least six applicants. Um, and as Ian has pointed out, in some areas, you've got a couple of hundred applicants for, um, for those places. So we have careers advisors who are working directly with young people through all stages of the school career. When does that start? It, sta it starts in primary school. In fact, we're doing stuff to encourage primary teachers and primary school pupils to use our digital platform so that they're making choices from an informed position as they go through. The so the transitions from primary school to secondary school, young people have got an idea of what, what a career is. They can work out what the strengths are so they can build on that as they're going through their, their um, secondary school career. Um, we have apprenticeships.scot which is a vacancy portal so young people can actually look at jobs that are available in particular sectors we've got blue chip companies we've got you know all sorts of organizations CITB are working with us on our digital platform and progressing more jobs onto app, app apprenticeships.scot so that young people can see there are jobs it's not just a bricky it's not just a carpenter there are you know building standards there's you know um a uh, clerks of works there's civil engineering there's a whole gamut of occupations and young people can plan their career accordingly now a lot of young people want to do vocational jobs they want to do you know jobs that involve making things or contributing to the making of things and other people want to you know to, to to design things and maybe you know sort of outline the plans for someone else to do so the digital platform my world of work allows young people to gather information it allows them then to demonstrate to their parents because as ian said sometimes it's difficult for a young person to persuade a parent that it's an apprenticeship they want to do and the validity of that um, that the qualifications that they will gain through an apprenticeship have an equivalence with further and higher education. And young people can go through an apprenticeship programme from foundation through to graduate and come out with a master's, equivalent of a master's degree. And that's very powerful, but it's a, it's a huge hill to climb in terms of changing hearts and minds in vocational education and achieving that parity of esteem. All our digital offering will help with that. But we need to get you know, messages out and we need to get industry to back this. We have case studies, someone mentioned already. We have case studies where you know, diverse individuals who are working in the industry, we're trying to you know, promote them as ambassadors so young people can aspire to be the same as them. It's not a closed occupation. You know, if you're a female or you're, you have a disability or you come from an eth ethnic background. So, Skills Development Scotland is spending a lot of time and effort to populate our digital platforms with information which is relevant for individuals, parents, teachers and employers and they're the most important because those are some of the hearts and minds we have to change because as Maureen said, you know, people tend to recruit in their likeness until they're shown something different. Mm -hmm. And so the case studies and examples that we've got, we've got, you know, talking heads, we've got video clips, etc., um, to demonstrate that. So okay, uh, thank you for that. And I just wondered if Professor Smith had um, anything to add to what he's heard. Thus okay, far. I currently chair the Short Life Working Group, the Scottish Government Group in New Housing Construction Skills. We've had a lot of involvement. Um, and thanks to SDS and the SMEs and also CITB, um, FMB, Scottish Builders Federation and Homes for Scotland. Um, that report will come out in the next two or three weeks. Um, make sure the committee has sight of that if it's not too late for yourselves. But we've broken it down into nine thematic areas about the sort of short, medium and longer term skills needs of the sector. And one of them is the outreach to schools. Um, linked to that, uh, we're involved with the southeast of Scotland city region deal for Edinburgh. 
And one of the aspects there has been the inclusive growth and trying to get more people to come into the sector in the southeast because there's going to be a 40% uplift in the number of new homes to be built over the next 20 years, um, which is a staggering amount of activity and work, and therefore the amount of jobs in the southeast of Scotland, which is the fastest growing region in Scotland, it's the fifth fastest growing region in the UK, can't be done with the, the normal routes. So we've worked with SDS and others to look at what are the systematic themes we will put into southeast Scotland, and this has been feeding into the the Short Life Working Group for New Housing Construction Skills for Scotland. There will be a specific focus on those early years, and as part of that early outreach, although the project has not started, we have been in to speak to all the head teachers of the primary schools in Edinburgh and the head teachers of the secondary schools. And that is to say we need to get in front of the teachers, the careers advisors. Uh, presumably, you'll be doing that out with Edinburgh as well, if um, it's the South East It's region. the South East, so it's the six local authorities for South East Scotland, um, and that will be working with um, DYW as well, with, with the local operational staff which are there. And one of the key features there is to build on what industry has been doing in the last few years, which is the design engineer construct or a class of your own. So this is going into primary schools or into secondary schools to raise the profile of what are the job opportunities in the sector. And the feedback from the teachers who are in these schools, who have been involved with the likes of these programmes, say it's going extremely well and very positive. But we've said to the primary head, the primary head teachers, because um, they were looking at us, why are you talking about skills, career pathways? This is so many years down the line. And we've said, because when we've asked our students who arrive at Napier, where did you first hear about sustainability, low carbon technologies, renewable energy? They all say primary school. Yep. So the primary school teachers have an incredibly influential role to plant a seed. Mm -hmm. And what we'd like to do with that is build on that and take that across South East Scotland. But the Short Life Working Group on the New Housing Construction Skills for Scotland will also be making that recommendation to come forward. Okay. And you can't just turn on a tap, but it's planting the seed. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Convener. Right. Um, Jamie Halcor Johnson. Yeah, thanks very much, much Convener. Just a couple of quick questions. Um, we talked about the, 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 the quality of applications, uh, of applicants coming through having fallen. Since when? Is there a particular reason that that's happened? There's a particular. Um, date, but year that that's happened is the last five years, ten years. Do you anything in terms of Perhaps one for, for me as an employer. Um, I think rather than say the, the quality, um, it's the variety in the applications. It's much of the same. So um, I receive, when we launch our apprenticeship opportunities, over a thousand applications throughout Scotland. The volume's there, but there's much of a sameness in terms of um, the the skills and competencies of, of those coming forward, or lack of skills in some cases. Um, I think the, the challenge that we have as a sector is that we're not getting that broad vocational and academic talent pipeline. That's wherein where the opportunity lies. And, and, and if we can broaden that, then that will help businesses grow. Okay, but is that something that's changed from the past? Did you used to get that vocational and academic kind of background? Or, or, or people that could be no, uh, that's. I think that's fundamentally one of the, of the biggest problems in the sector okay. is that we have this narrow channel right. of skill level yeah. coming in, typically vocational, non-academic that have dropped out, you know, okay. um, education and on to full-time NPAs. Thank you, because Ian Hughes, you, you said as well. I think that the, the quality is that what you meant that, that perhaps it was there was there was too narrow a group of people coming through, or did you mean that the general well, I, th I think I think Maureen is absolutely correct. I mean, again, I can only speak from what, what our employers are saying, our customers. Um, so we had a painter and decorator, had two apprenticeships, 70 applications. And, and, and he said once he sifted through the applications, he could only get it down to a short list of four. And eventually, when they went through his internal recruitment processes, they didn't recruit anyone. Um, and what he was saying to me, and just in terms of the skills that the applicants were bringing to the table just weren't as strong as they would have been 10, 15, 20 years ago. Now, whether there's a direct correlation between what happened in the schools 10, 20 years ago, I don't, I don't know. Um, but this employer was definitely saying that the, the, the quality of the experience that the young person was bringing, now that, that, that could be 
partly because the, the population of young people were, were doing other things. They were less interested in becoming a painter and decorator and were more interested in moving into college or university or food and drink or manufacturing. Um, we've talked about the image and the recruitment issues and the, the, and the, the pipeline of talent diminishing from the school cohort. And I think it's because construction probably hasn't kept up with its competitors in terms of the offer that it, that it has. Now, the offer is extremely strong, huge opportunities, great career opportunities. I just don't think it's kept up with um, some of the other sectors who are in the schools also wanting a piece of that pupil and their offer and their proposition. And I think it's something as a, as a sector, uh, you know, and, as, 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 and, and with public sector partners, we need to address, basically, um, because I think it boils down to what does the economic impact have on the country um, of construction? What does it have? And it has a very big impact. Uh, so I think it would be remiss of us not to try and address some of that opportunity and talent pipeline, which is weak at the present time, I would suggest. Do you, do you think, and this may be open to the panel, do you think a lot of schools, rather than encouraging people perhaps to go into apprenticeship or even colleges, are, are encouraging their students to aim towards university? Is that an area that perhaps we don't have a parity of esteem with, universe, uh, with, with um, uh, um, apprenticeship places and we, we need to value as society apprenticeships more? Uh, certainly uh, some of the uh, quali uh, quantitative and qualitative type uh, information we're receiving uh, anecdotally is that uh, uh, the, the better students are being directed towards university um, and that seems to be the trend. Um, the, the other piece of information that comes to us, uh, and I have no evidence of this apart from what people see, feel, perceive, is that the students or the, the young apprentices that do come along don't have uh, the skills in you know, talking to people, um, dealing with customers, um, attitudes towards work are different. So there is a, there is a change in how the, the young people are coming forward from schools, um, but that is anecdotal. Sure. Very briefly, um, foundation apprenticeships will hopefully yes. start to turn the tide in that respect because young people are making positive choices about careers and about moving into particular industries and during the senior phase of school they're getting both academic underpinning knowledge but also most importantly they're getting vocational opportunities working with employers. So hopefully when those young people are moving from school and from foundation apprenticeships, they're much more attractive employees for employers to take on. So there's a smooth transition from school foundation apprenticeship into modern apprenticeship because they have those skills and they're equipped with <coughs> an understanding of the industry they're moving into. So they're hopefully not making any wrong choices um, in that respect. Okay, thank you. BT on that point. Um, there's obviously some positive comments we made about uh, foundation apprenticeships and uh, graduate apprenticeships and so on, but clearly there is a there is an issue out there that, about uh, the uh, quality of the applications and so on that have been explored to some extent. Do we still have more work to do specifically in relation to construction apprenticeships to redesign these to better shape them for the future? Is there still more work there? It's one of the discussions that come up at the Short Life Working Group early on because of the shortage, for example, of bricklayers uh, and other areas for the, for the sector. Um, and not taking any away from the electrical side, anyway else, there's, there's shortages there too. Um, but in the relation to bricklaying, we have a number of house builders who want to take on apprentices who perhaps in the past haven't or haven't invested the same. Um, they've generally gone to their subcontractors. Um, and they're finding it difficult to take on um, young people who want to do a four-year modern apprenticeship in bricklaying. Um, the house builders of some of them have also made the comments that, well, we don't want them to do curved walls and arches at this point. We'd just like them to get them in, start bricklaying, start working on houses. <coughs> Can we do a, a qualification, not a full MA, but a qualification which is bricklaying for house building? So we're getting them in, we're getting them excited, we've got them salaried, and then can we step them up to that MA and, and lead them on to the, the future? So I think there's a... There's a request from parts of the sector, not all, uh, and this isn't watering down, this is not an MA by the back door or anything. This is a, a, a sector that's saying, they're listening to young people who are saying they want to be at work probably slightly quicker, they're interested to do various things, there's a need, there's a demand, could we maybe adapt some of those? 
And when we look at some of the skills and technologies to come, I mean, as a sector, it's incredibly exciting. I mean, the next 10, 20 years is transformational, not just in Scotland, but globally, with the amount of new technologies and clean tech and other infrastructure required, in addition to all of the retrofit and the traditional craft skills. So do our current, when we've had discussions with some organisations to say, well, what about if you brought out a qualification in that area? I think there's a general feeling that it might take a bit longer than they thought. There's a lot of paperwork, there's a lot of hurdles. So is there a request there from the industry to maybe to adapt some of how we approach the SQA, how we approach some of our qualifications to make that more amenable, adaptable to the current and future sector's needs? And how are the industry training organisations responding to that? We respond to employer demand extensively. Um, we, <coughs> we will assist uh, with partners in the public sector in designing qualifications where there is proven demand from employers for that qualification. There is no point in spending the time, efforts and money in designing something which has no pickup um, from the employers who actually want to uh, retain individuals within their business. So if there's a demand from employers, we react to that. We bring our standards and qualifications colleagues round the table with employers to design a qualification which they will then pick up through the, the employment route itself. So we are not prescriptive. Um, we, we, we strongly support the existing four-year craft apprenticeship, for example, in Scotland. Um, however, if there was demand for other qualifications within the sector, we would respond to that positively um, across the board. If I may, um, our, our four-year craft apprenticeship, as I said earlier, is regarded um, and, and envied by many. Um, but our particular organisation, that four-year craft apprenticeship, at the end of that, did not produce, similar to what Janet was saying earlier, um, did not produce that, that the outcome um, because they learned things that they didn't do and they didn't learn things that they did do, in, in short. Um, and so we have a specialist apprenticeship programme now, which is specific to house building, but it's not one or the other. We have to have a, a spectrum of qualifications that create pathways, which we don't have at the moment, but pathways so you can go and do a craft apprenticeship and work in repair and maintenance and then move into house building, do your transitionary training and then become a specialist in price work and so on. We don't have these pathways. So if we can protect what's great and good, but then develop other qualifications specific to sector, perhaps apprenticeship models, shared apprenticeship models in the rurals and the highlands and the islands. We have the tools at our disposal, but we're very narrow um, in terms of what our offering is. We're very rigid, and I think that's where the opportunity lies to generate um, greater capacity in the sector. In the BSE sector, uh, we take a holistic view of uh, training. Um, we train people to be able to work in the commercial sector, the domestic sector and the industrial sector. Uh, we see that is uh, the right way to go about things because then when people move from job to job, employer to employer, they can adapt to suit that employer's uh, particular type of business. We also encourage and do provide continuing professional development in the new technologies, the new renewable technologies, electric vehicle charging installation. Um, and uh, building standards, all of these things, and we see very much as the craftsman is the, 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 the core uh, with top-up training in the specialisms. Um, and that is part of, you know, uh, I didn't get a chance to say it but earlier, but we seek professionalism in our trades. And uh, particularly in the electrotechnical sector, we are seeking protection of title so that we can get protect professionalism into the industry. And people will have a pride in being an electrician, uh, not just because they are properly trained and well trained, but because they are electricians. So that's where we are. Just, just to continue on this, some of the submissions that we've had and evidence uh, sent into us have expressed concerns about the apprenticeships being dumbed down or diluted in some way. Do, do, do you have any views on that? 
That's, that's our apprenticeship programme. We are one of those examples of, of the dumbing down. Um, so the challenge was, um, which I expressed earlier, we, the, the outcome um, in terms of the learner skills was, was not what we needed to deliver a zero defect roof. Um, and we worked actually hard with the institutions, the qualifications bodies, apprenticeships. We worked really hard to try and change the content and, and, and we weren't able to because it's a generic qualification that quite rightly has to cover all elements because very few companies will be doing a particular thing in volume. So it's an unusual situation. So in four years, I've uh, put 50 apprentices through the scheme, half of which are now out in industry qualified of of that half, um, half are working for other contractors, but that's okay because they will come back again. And then the other half are in training either in their, their second or they recently recruited this year. And it's done in a, in a residential programme. And what we seek to do there is to not just develop the individual, um, but the learning is contextualised to industry standards. So it's that industry standard piece that the quality control element, the fabric of what we do in volume that we cannot represent Replicate elsewhere at other training providers. So um, whilst we are a contractor, we didn't step into training, we fell into training because we couldn't get the skilled workers that we're looking for. So I, I would argue we're not an example of dilution, but I do understand the fear. When you look what's happened in England, for example, it's a plethora of confusion, different training providers. We're not like that in Scotland. We've primarily got one um, qualifications body, not me, but primarily one. You know, we've got funding council, we've got skills development Scotland. We're kind, we don't have the the massive kind of population. Down. So we can figure this out if we're creative. And I think a lot of what you may hear is a lot of closed minds and protectionism because that's the way it's going to be. Well, back to the original question: if we're going to change what our industry looks like and who's in our industry. Then we have to challenge fundamentally how we do things. And I think we can do that through skills and training. So we do need to uh, modernise our MA program. By the way, just without, I'd, that's maybe a different discussion. Okay, Thank I you. think we'll need to move on to that point. Uh, Jackie Bailey. Much of my questioning has been covered, but let me ask Professor Smith about CITB, because earlier on you talked about digital transformation. CITB actually um, expressed concern that the industry has yet to undergo the digital transformation it needs. Why do you think this is, um, and what do we need to do to make it happen? Um, I thought maybe that would go to CITB. <laughs> no, no, I'm asking you for I'll come to them. <laughs> Um, well, I th well, digital transformation is happening a variety of different measures. And again, if I may use the example of South East Scotland, the, the two principal skills gateways that are planned for South East Scotland for the Edinburgh and South East City Region deal are data-driven innovation and housing construction infrastructure because they're the two largest growth sectors for this regional economy. And that integration of what's happening digitally or with data and the integration of where future infrastructure is going um, it is still a bit of a learning journey. So if we could take BIM as an example, Building Information Modelling. Um, it was great that the governments, both south of the border and north of the border, wanted to encourage BIM. Um, but one of the requests that we'll be bringing from the Short Life Working Group is that when we do have major consultations on changes on skills or, or changes on building regulations or other policies, we probably need to have a skills impact analysis no one turned around to the colleges and universities or the companies and said, do you have enough BIM trained? What's the investment you require for software? How many licenses do you need? And so we had this very short termism, sadly, where there wasn't that initial investment. Um, people were recovering from the sector, from the recession. And as a result, you then had this huge churn of people who were BIM, building information model qualified, jumping big companies to get increased salaries because there just wasn't the supply. So in terms of, and I can't blame CITB for that because they weren't responsible for the policy, but when a policy change comes, which is important and helps the sector for the future, I think with it has to come the investment. Now, things are happening now in BIM and BIM training and the Innovation Centre and others are doing things, but I think that's an example of where the cart came before the horse. Um, so if we're going to embrace digital correctly, I think we need to make sure that the training that we require for some of that training or digital content or this is then ready to then roll out. Okay. Ian Hughes? Yeah, the, the, the whole space of, of 
digitalization, um, certainly in my opinion, lies within the future skills uh, requirements of, uh, of industry um, and, and their, their staff. So we've recently signed a partnership agreement with Construction Scotland Innovation Centre um, with uh, four key themes running through it, digital being one of them in its widest sense, not, not restricted to, to BIM. Um, and in our vision in that space essentially is to enable employers to access the right training within future skills with our financial support um, in order to get their workforce and their business capability uh, moving forward. So I think in terms of that model that we have in, within CITB of not directly delivering things like future skills when we have an innovation centre for Scotland which is tasked with doing this type of thing, uh, what we bring to the innovation centre is hopefully our employer network of interested parties um, and investment uh, as well. So yes, we are keen and, and next month we are launching a major uh, funding initiative around digitalisation, which will be a commissioned funding bid open to the marketplace, but being nation specific, uh, we are required. So Scotland, England, Wales um, will be able to bid separately if, if they need to. Good. And I'll leave it there unless somebody has anything new to add. No, thank you, convener. Thank you. And now Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, before I move on to my own questions, I wanted to ask you a, a question about uh, training levies. Construction companies pay two levies for training, the CITB levy and the UK Government Apprenticeship levy. Do Scottish companies benefit from the UK Government Apprenticeship levy or is it seen as another form of taxation? Just, just in terms of an overview, <coughs> there are... There are approximately 70 companies in Scotland uh, pay the joint apprenticeship levy to both CITB and the Westminster levy as well. So these are 70 companies with a payroll exceeding £3 million. So we work and we we'll have worked with these companies on a one-to-one -one basis and we did offer them a transition financial assistance in the first year. Um, and we fully accept and, and we are, are working closely with Westminster in order to get the message across from and via employers and via the Construction Leadership Council, for example, that to have one sector having to administer two levies um, within that kind of tier one level in particular doesn't make particular sense in terms of economies of scale or efficiencies of scale. Um, the main difference, I think, in Scotland and England, and, and colleagues may want to comment, is that the, the, our English companies, our English employers um, who pay the apprenticeship levy can then tap into a digital uh, process of accessing funds, limited funds to train in very specific areas. Um, now that's very, very different from the CITB levy and the diversity that we bring um, in terms of additional leverage, uh, additional value. So I think there is something obviously working with employers um, that, that needs to be done in this space just to make sure that there's a bit of a level playing field. Um, we, will, we will undoubtedly, and we are under pressure from our tier one customers asking us, you know, why are we paying two levies? Why do we need to pay a construction levy? To, you know, it's managed by CITB um, as well as a Westminster levy. So they're, so they're asking the question and quite, it's coming off their P&L, so they have the right to ask the question. Um, so I think there's work to be done here with Westminster government in particular in order to try and rebalance um, the impact on the sector itself. Professor Sloan. So it's come up in the discussions in the working group and there's a general feeling from the larger companies that there is more transparency in England of how the apprenticeship levy is spent or what they see and perhaps there's a role coming forward or a function for Scottish Government just to make it probably a bit more transparent of how the levy is then spent in Scotland by sector and that might reflect back of how if you're in construction and you're paying into the apprenticeship levy and the monies are coming back north, and how much is then going into the sector in, in the various forms, whether it's FAs, MAs, graduate apprenticeships, whatever else it's happening. Um, so I, I would say it, it, it was a, several voices raised in that regard that they would like to see more transparency, because in England they can see how they're spending or where, where, where it's going. Okay. Yep. ...of uh, the industry are small and micro, so they don't... Um, the CITB levy provides a different 
form of support to the sector, which invalu is invaluable to Scotland. So Scotland actually receives back from the Industry Training Board far more than it puts in, because it trains, and rightfully it's so. And CITB um, have the challenge of being able to communicate clearly the, the offering and the, the value add it brings back um, to the, the large, the medium and the micro, because it's moved away from a, a grants in money out to levy in skills out. So um, they, are, they are two very different things. Okay. Uh, moving on to my own questions. The Construction Index website highlighted in 2017, I think it was, that 94% of Scottish respondents were dissatisfied with aspects of CITB. So my question is, what needs to change to make the governance and operation of CITB more accountable to Scottish CITB levy payers? It's an interesting statistic. <coughs> I'll throw another statistic back. When we carried out our last consensus poll in Scotland, uh, we had over 80% response um, uh, happy with what CITB are doing um, in terms of its business. So <laughs> I think in terms of who you speak to and what stats you use, um, it's interesting um, what those responses are. Our, our governance model basically is changing. Um, our structure is changing. It's in the public domain. We are downsizing our headcount. Uh, that's a reaction to what employers and governments and institutions have been telling us for a number of years. Um, we became too large, too complex, uh, too bloated, one would say. Um, so we are, are re reducing our headcount and reducing what we are doing um, and we will concentrate within our key three operational areas, which are training and development, uh, careers and standards and qualifications. And everything else we have been doing over the decades will be moved aside, either outsourced or sold off uh, in terms of our future operating model. Our timeline is to achieve that by 2020. Um, this does not mean by any stretch of the imagination we will be investing less within skills and training and certainly not be, we'll be investing more within this whole area, particularly in Scotland, uh, because of the research that was carried out last year. So the, so the, so the change is within, fundamentally, the back wiring, the back engine of the business. Um, we are increasing our customer-facing units uh, on the ground in Scotland, whether it's apprenticeships or company advisors who are on the ground. Um, so I think that and our change to the governance model, which is now a Scottish council, which is 100% employer-led um, with, within that council. Um, so we have a split of roughly 50% tier ones and 50% SMEs uh, and micros on the Scottish council. And their role is to hold the main CITB board to account in terms of what's happening in Scotland. So that change was implemented quarter one this year, maybe, maybe quarter, the final quarter of last year, um, and we will monitor that new governance model to make sure that it has the impact and influence over what we do in Scotland um, based on CITB strategy com coming out of HQ. Uh, I think you know, Stuart wanted okay. to come in as well on that point. Um, CITB are very relevant in Scotland. Um, we rely on CITB to shape um, standards and frameworks which um, sort of set out the framework within which qualifications are then developed and we rely on them to work with industry to identify where you know technology has changed and qualifications and the standard themselves you know which is the national occupational standard which governs which governs the jobs and and job descriptions etc cetera, etc cetera, are all kept up to date so for me, there's a definite relevance in Scotland. Um, it's like any organisation, you know, there's challenges, you know, to do more with less and be better and faster and more responsive. And, you know, I think CITB are, um, are developing towards that. You know, they're looking at the things that they are their core activities and they're going to do them, you know, better um, as we go forward. You know, we spoke about the... Um, negative perceptions of the industry, CITB, you know, are going to be doing more. They do a huge amount of work in relation to diversity. 
Um, they work with us. We have a five-year equalities plan, and they work very close with, uh, with, with us in SDS, as do our other partners, to try and change some of those you know, entrenched behaviours and, and patterns. Um, so, you know, there's a huge task for them, you know, to rise to the challenge on. And I think, you know, it's exciting that, you know, the shape that they're trying to get into for 2020, you know, should really, you know, help us make a difference in Scotland and make it a much more stronger um, sector. I, I mean, that's, that's good to hear that um, there's new governance arrangements coming in, so there must have been concerns you had to address within your membership. But my next question is, how much collaboration is there between the two bodies, given that you both have responsibility for providing apprenticeships? I think there's great collaboration. Um, and as I, I mentioned in a number of times, CITB are you know, um, using our digital platform and as they digitise their activity, you know, they're in a better place, you know, to to be much more responsive. Um, they help us, you know, as we try to um, get enough information and relevant information and up to date information onto our platforms to allow young people to make informed choices about their future and the parents and teachers, etc. So yes, there's a huge amount of collaboration. You know, the regional plans that they have. Um, you know, we can't do. None of us can do this ourselves. Mm -hmm. We all have to work together, yeah. um, and I think you know it's quite exciting as we move forward into that you know sort of mm -hmm. new future. Just, just before you come in, Mr. Hughes, um, the reason for asking that question is some of the written uh, submissions that we received from uh, Glasgow Caledonia University in particular said there was little evidence of any collaboration between the two bodies. And they also said that as far as Scotland was concerned, CIBT, CITB was out of touch in, re in meeting the needs of uh, the industry. So you're telling us one thing, but the yeah. written submissions we've had from another organisation so is suggesting Yeah, otherwise. there are two aspects to this. CITB are our biggest contractor for apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. So from a training and you know, delivery, operational delivery, they're a huge um, partner. On the other side, in terms of standards, frameworks, and qualifications, you know they shape, you know they take information from companies like Maureen's and you know other small companies, but also tier one um, uh, suppliers as well, and try to shape a framework which will allow individuals to be trained for the industry, not just one job, so that when the down, if a downturn comes, mm -hmm. that they can move, they're mobile, they can change, and you know into other jobs that become available um, you know some of the work that we've done recently um, in the downturn in oil and gas the transition training fund and um, has set you know a, a fabulous uh, model for being responsive and you know being fleet of foot to help individuals change from one industry into another now construction has been you know a huge supporter of that because they have benefited from people moving from oil and gas industry into construction we have we run an adopt an apprenticeship scheme with CITB again, you know, to try to change, you know, tackle some of the perceptions that you know um, an apprentice can only you know complete their apprenticeship if they're in employment when it comes to doing the skills test. You know, we've challenged through CITB, you know, trade uh, organisations to allow you know, some of those qualifications or the skills test to be done, you know, six months before the end, because essentially they have the underpinning knowledge and the vocational capability and competence to do that at that point. So, you know, I would say, you know, perhaps, you know, some of the submissions, you know, perhaps don't understand the complexity and the depth of partnership working that we have. But I would say from an SDS perspective, you know, it is a very um, good collaboration with okay. CIT. Mr. Hughes. No, no, it's, <coughs> it's just to re-emphasise the point that, as you well know, skills, training and education are devolved across the three nations. Um, and we are moving our business model to reflect that. So we align ourselves with public sector partners uh, to deliver government policy extensively. We don't create the CITB policy within three nations. We align ourselves with what government wants us to do in terms of priorities, uh, and we make sure that is communicated to our employer customer base uh, to make sure they know where their money is being invested within. So in terms of the alignment with organisations like SDS, and there's other public sector bodies we 
have agreements with uh, and are putting in place shortly as well. It's to deliver the, the policy set by government. It's not to work in a vacuum or a bubble, and we cannot do that in isolation. Okay. Just final question is, um, I believe the National Construction College uh, in Chinon is getting closed with 29 training jobs moving down to York. Can you give us some background to that? There are six college networks which we are withdrawing from in terms of direct delivery. We are not withdrawing from the training being provided. Um, what that means is we will not deliver the scaffolding training in Inshinan uh, moving forward. So that's part of our operating model. We will find a new partner and enable them to deliver that scaffolding training. So we, we have publicly said we will not be withdrawing from any specialist training in any nation until a better alternative can be found within the marketplace. Much of what we evolved in doing over the decades was because of market failure. So we stepped in and we invested and we directly trained scaffolding, for example, at Shinnan. We believe the market is now in a position to pick up training. We have a tremendous FE network in Scotland, for example, with infrastructure, with assets, with skills. Um, I'm not saying they will pick up in Shinnan, but there are organisations out there, we believe, can do it as well, if not better, than CITB. So our overall model is to withdraw from that, but not to do that at the jeopardy of the training being provided. You cannot stop scaffolding being trained in, in this country. It would be, it would be disastrous. A number of other functions right. within Inshinan are being outsourced to other organisations, and they are in the process of colleagues having conversations with those new organisations to decide where they may or may not be located in the future. So I cannot comment on whether they will go to York or not. All that right. Part of the Sorry, just to interrupt there, we're, we're sort of um, a bit uh, pressed for time here. Um, so I'll have to um, cut you off there because I think Dean Lockhart wanted to come in very briefly and also Andy Whiteman has a question as well. That, thanks, Convener. I'll keep it brief. I wanted to come back to the observation made by a couple of panel members that uh, Scotland doesn't do enough to train older people uh, either in work or, or, or between jobs. We've heard about the role of apprenticeships in, t in, in a, uh, addressing this gap, but what about part-time college places? How important are part-time college places for retraining uh, older workers uh, in the sector, and are there enough college places available uh, to meet this uh, issue? And uh, Ian Hughes, perhaps I could ask you first, because I think you made the observation about uh, we're not doing enough to train older, older people in the sector. I think in terms of the investment that goes into that cohort, we'll call them, for example, it's about priorities, and, and I'm sure Fiona <coughs> will comment on this better than myself. The, and the priority, priority for government in the present time is 16 to 19 year olds in terms of modern apprenticeships, for example. Our employers are saying they would be more than happy, and, and, and many of them would be delighted to work with older entrants into the workplace. The, the, the funding model at the present time makes it difficult because the reality is when you have a 25-year-old entering in to construction on an apprenticeship rate in terms of wages, it's not attractive. So, so we are keen to explore is there more we can do in this space to make it an attractive proposition for an older individual to enter. But the present time in terms of modern apprenticeships, like Fiona, I think I'm right in saying, government's priorities are that younger cohort, um, and that's where we concentrate our resources at present. Policy is to give young people the best start they can into careers. However, a third of the modern apprenticeship programme is actually 25 year olds plus. And as I mentioned earlier on, many of those individuals are, you know, doing leadership and management. So, you know, they're progressing their careers and using the apprenticeship. Employers are using the apprenticeship for workforce development. So many of them are doing level four um, in, you know. Uh, construction site management, for example. Many of them are um, retraining from other industries and taking the opportunity, but it's down to the employers and the support that employers, you know, make um, in terms of, you know, wage costs, etc. you know, when an individual is maybe not as productive at the start of their career as they are as they move through their training. Um, so a third of apprenticeships currently um, are 25 plus. Sure. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we, we have other business we have to deal with before um, one o'clock and members also have other matters to attend to um, in Parliament. 
Um, if there's anything you wish to add to your evidence today on any of these points that we've perhaps not had time to cover fully or to come in on some of these last questions, then please do feel free to write into the committee uh, and that will be treated as, as part of your evidence. So um, apologies that we need to uh, cut things short there, but thank you very much to everyone for coming in um, and we'll uh, suspend the meeting very briefly just to allow the witnesses to leave.